one. Let's everybody grab a seat. Let's get started with the next session. I'm your host for the next one hour for the next two sessions. My name is Christoph. I'm partner at IBM Ventures. We do strategic investments in later stage companies, everything that's deep tech and AI enabled in the B2B space. And um, our next guest coming up is Clive Cox from um, Selden, CTO. And um, he will tell us more about um, deployment of open source machine learning. Please welcome Clive and give him some hands. Great, thank you. I think, I think I've got a mic. So. Uh, great, thank you. Um, so, um, just a bit about myself and the company I work for. So, I work for Selden. We were, we were based in the Barclays FinTech Accelerator. Uh, we participated in the uh, Barclays TechStars uh, Accelerator a couple of years ago. Um, and we're quite a generalist platform, we're, but we're really focusing on machine learning deployment. Um, we've got two products, so we've got open source uh, machine learning, which I'm going to talk about today, is one of the, th one of the products that we're um, um, evolved in, and we then we ha we're working on a, a deployed product, which is much higher level, so enterprise machine learning um, deployment, graphical interface and stuff. We do do end-to-end -end machine learning projects, so we, we um, have worked in several projects, so not just the deployment, but also on the actual data science as well. That really gives us experience in certain verticals, you know, because we're working in fintechs, working in different banks, so... We do FX currency prediction. We've worked with North American Bank there. It's obviously got quite low latency, quite stringent uh, requirements on, on that. And we do have a, we're doing another project in churn prediction, so completely different. It's not, like not low latency, um, but different challenges there. And we also do sort of content recommendation with HP. So quite a varied set of products, but we're really focusing on deployment. And these projects really give us more experience, really, of what um, at the sort of battle face of what, what is required by our, by our customers. Oh, yeah, and we also um, do the TensorFlow meetup in London, uh, which is the largest UK TensorFlow meetup. Uh, it gets about 100 people every month or so. And so if you guys are anybody interested in um, learning more about TensorFlow, we have a range of talks, quite advanced, quite beginner. And so yeah, look out for that. So what I want to talk about today is uh, really a couple of things. Try to convince you machine learning on Kubernetes is, is, is a good thing. And I'll explain, I'll explain what Kubernetes is if you don't know what it is. And discuss two projects. One is Kubeflow which is um, a project that's come out of Google. It was launched at KubeCon in December of last year, um, open source. And our own uh, open source project, Selden Core, which was uh, released in January. And they're both in this ecosystem which, of machine learning on top of Kubernetes. But so the, over, the over, so arching um, thing that needs to be at the back of your mind is what, one thing we're trying to solve is get different personas to work together to get a successful data science project. So you obviously have your data scientist that's doing the analyzing the data, creating the predictive model. But then there's sometimes a tension between those and the DevOps that have to put it into production and manage that. They don't have the experience of the actual data science. And, um, and the other way around, the data scientists don't really want to work a lot with DevOps. You've got to get that tension there uh, to work out uh, uh, successfully to get a good project. And then obviously you've got the people who have to do the approvals and are setting up the project, want to check whether you're actually getting the ROI on the project, et cetera. And to get in these three personas that, uh, to work well is, is like a real challenge. And that's also what we're trying to solve at a sort of a high level, basically, um, as in, in the work we're doing. So this is a slide from Kubeflow uh, that I've taken, really just showing that to do a successful data science project has a lot of stages. A lot of things you've got to go through, and you really need to try and solve these in a consistent manner from the development into production, because if there's sort of disparities or gaps into how you're solving things, that's more likely to introduce bugs in, in what you're trying to do. So it's complex, and the projects we're trying to do is trying to make it easier for data scientists to actually um, make a successful data science project that's, that's um, doing all these different steps, basically, all the way through. So first quick um, step about Kubernetes and why that would be a good thing. So just a quick introduction to Kubernetes for those in the room who don't know it. Basically, it's trying to solve the issue that if you're trying to create a Dockerized application, normally you have many different types of services that need to talk together uh, via the network or and need to have different hardware requirements, and you need to orchestrate all those. And that's really difficult to do at scale. So Kubernetes is a platform that's basically like a um, sort of compute platform that allows you to describe your deployments and um, it manages it on scales from one, one machine up to several thousand nodes. And basically takes away the pain of building these complex services. And obviously machine learning is a complex service that needs to be run. And so building on top of Kubernetes is, is, is a great uh, um, thing to do for machine learning. Then more sort of, um, specifically some reasons why it's great. I mean, it's cloud neutral. So you, if you're choosing Kubernetes, you can run on any cloud or on-prem. And it's 
reasonably simple to then move between those different um, situations. Also has abstractions over the hardware you will need for uh, machine learning, such as GPUs. So you can say these, these uh, tasks require GPU and it will push it onto nodes that have GPU, etc. And then at the top left, there's some standard things that come as part of Kubernetes, which really need to be solved as part of any software project, but are also important for machine learning um, deployment and shouldn't be forgotten. So that's something like sort of role-based authentication, so you can check that the, that the um, application that's running can only do certain things in, with certain resources, so it's limited there. Health checks and scaling and quota management, so you can um, ensure that your particular machine learning deployments are not using too much quota. So all these are there, and therefore makes a great platform to therefore build machine learning on top of. And there's a lot of projects out there like Spark, um, Jupyter, which are running now on top of Kubernetes, and our project and Qflow are, are part of that sort of ecosystem. So coming back to this um, set of stages to solve machine learning and just situating the two projects I'm going to talk about. So Selden Core is really just focused on deployment. These last stages at the end and perhaps, I suppose, logging as well. Um, and Kubeflow um, out of Google is really trying to, in my opinion, to create like an ecosystem of machine learning. So trying to get best practice of so, so data scientists can choose the different tools they want to use to solve these stages and to bring them in easily together to create your data science project. So I'm going to discuss a bit about Qflow. There's, there's the reference if you want to look at it on GitHub. Um, and here's a few more reasons they've given um, from Qflow for why they think uh, machine learning on Kubernetes is important. First, you've got the abstraction. I was mentioned over GPUs, and there's a lot of work on other types of hardware, like so F, FPGAs in the future, so you can easily require these as part of your setup. It's, easily, it's easy to create abstractions on top of Kubernetes, and that's what Selden Core and Kubeflow does in terms of describing high-level machine learning um, tasks that you want to run, and that's what we do to like, make it easier to actually deploy machine learning services. Um, you can scales, obviously, I've said that, um, and there's a lot of standard base images that are out there that m allow you to build up these um, projects easily um, and connect them together. Um, also, it's, it's um, really uh, easy to create auto-scaling as well, so you can create auto-scaling based on certain metrics, which is obviously key for your deployment um, situations, and you can also, if you've got um, sort of constrained resources allow sets certain um, levels like um, to get rid of um, tasks that have low priority um, and, and push that high priority tasks in. And finally, it's got things like sort of data gravity. So obviously, you, some tasks need to run on nodes that have got local, um, local data that it needs to run, and that's also part of there. So you can use that as part of Kubernetes, and that's key to a lot of machine learning tasks. And you can specify, as I pretty much said, you can specify certain requirements for the hardware you need. So as things get deployed onto your cluster, they go to the appropriate nodes that have that hardware, such as GPUs, et cetera. So Qflow um, is basically built up a set of components. This is what they have right now. So there's um, Kasonic, which is basically a deployment platform, um, a deployment tool for Kubernetes to allow you to de deploy certain set of packages. Um, they have a Jupyter Hub built in, so that comes up as part of Qflow. And they have TensorFlow training. Um, built in, and they've created an abstraction over that, which I'll give a, a, a short um, example in a second. And they use Argo, which you may not have heard of, which is like a workflow tool to basically allow you to build up your pipeline of tasks, you know, for training and deployment into a set of um, a graph of, of things that have to be done one after the other to actually put your, your training and uh, deployment into practice, into your sort of continuous integration, etc. And deployment, um, they're using things like reverse proxy ambassador, which we're always also using, which makes it easier to then tie in your apps to external applications that need to use your machine learning. Um, and TensorFlow, yes, they've got that, and we're also part of that. So Selden Core and TensorFlow are two um, deployment uh, um, components you can choose as part of that. What they're doing into the future, they're looking at batch inference. Obviously, that's, that's key for uh, certain tasks. And they're, tr uh, they're trying to make it easy for um, users to get good metrics from the various um, tools they're using. And they're looking to integrate more um, different types of machine learning toolkits. So they've got um, TensorFlow um, serving in TensorFlow right now, and they're looking for MXNX, PyTorch, and things like Pachyderm um, as well in, in the near future. And a central dashboard. So it's really making it easy for, for data scientists to use all of these things, basically. So what they've done in terms of Kubernetes is they've basically extended it. Kubernetes allows you to extend the sort of resources that you can describe. So they've extended it to allow you to describe a TensorFlow job. In this case, it's a um, distributed TensorFlow job here with three parts, a master work and a um, parameter server. So you can easily just, um, add the images and the appropriate parts of that and say, OK, here's 
my description of what I want to run to run my TensorFlow job. You push that through the standard Kubernetes API, and then it, um, the um, operator that's running that they've written as part of Kubernetes will then um, interpret that uh, description and launch your TensorFlow job and your um, training to run on that. Um, so using Kubeflow, basically, at the moment, it's, it's case on it, so it's still command line. So you basically choose the packages you want to install. So you say you, you want to store the core Kubeflow, you want to store TensorFlow job or TensorFlow serving, and put that in as, as part of the packages you, you want to uh, deploy. But it's easy to just change those. So you say you don't want to use TensorFlow serving, you can just change that and use Southern Core instead and put that as part of your package um, setup. Um, so yeah, as I say, TensorFlow Serving is core to what they do, and I think TensorFlow Serving is definitely a great project. It's really focused on um, low latency um, situations. Um, it uses gRPC, which if you don't know, it's like a binary protocol, so it's, it's very um, good for low latency in terms of that, and they've optimized the gRPC impl implementation that comes in standard um, uh, to optimize it for large data structures you might get in terms of um, uh, prediction. And, um, also done some great things in terms of predictive batching. Um, so um, if you've got different requests coming in on, on your machine learning uh, uh, predictions, you might say, well, I need to have a limit of, say, 100 milliseconds to get my responses back. And they basically join the request together, um, understanding how long it normally takes for the um, request to be responded by the prediction. And then they send it out. So basically, it's batching to get maximum throughput through your GPUs. And they put a lot of work to do that. And it's, it's, re it's, it's really good. Um, so, yes, yeah, so it allows you to do basically single models. It's, I think most people are using it just for TensorFlow models, but it is pluggable. You can write your own um, whatever models you want to um, and run on TensorFlow serving, uh, but mostly people use it for um, um, that, that use case. And for single model scenarios, it does have A-B testing, and you can switch between new versions of models and update that quite easily. So it's, it's, it's been around for a couple of years, um, and certainly for low latency situations where you want to have a single model you want to optimize, I think it's, it's a great... Uh, product and that comes as part of Qflow. So the idea is obviously to make that easy to use for data scientists. So now I want to dis discuss the project I work on, Seldom Core. Um, and as part of that, as I say, we're just focusing on deployment. So I just want to go through some of the deployment challenges that we think needs to be solved and some of the things we're working on in Seldom Core to solve that. So first, there's the core deployment aspects. So launching your deployment, scaling it up and down. A lot of this is helped by the fact you're using Kubernetes. So you get a lot of um, buy-in from that, basically. But then there's but then how do you want to update your deployment? And there's various ways to update your deployment, and I'll go through various situations that we're, we're covering, like rolling, canary, and blue-green, et cetera. Then there's all aspects of optimization we want to work on. So um, obviously you want to limit the amount of money you're spending on the infrastructure for your machine learning deployment. So trying to optimize that so you're using your resources to the best of um, what's available in your cluster is key. And also, also optimizing your latency. So obviously TensorFlow Serving is great for that, and we want to also concentrate on that, so it limits your latency, and that also helps your um, infrastructure costs. And so, so that ties into throughput, and then also optimizing models. So you've got different models, um, and so you might want to optimize between having multiple models running and um, optimize between which one is working best in real time and push traffic towards that. And we have various components um, to, that, to do that. Secondly, as part of what we do, Definitely you want to expose your uh, machine learning deployment to, to, to your business apps. And for that, um, REST and gRPC is probably the most um, common ways to do that. REST is obviously easiest to use. You, it's adjacent, but it's probably slower. It's, there's a lot of um, time wasted in serial, serialization and deserialization. Um, so gRPC is the other option. And in Seldon Core, we have both, basically. So you, it, it automatically exposes both of those for you. Um, for what we're doing right now in Seldon Core, it's um, focused on synchronous, real-time, low latency, and in the future we'll probably want to look at asynchronous. So you need to um, cover those aspects and um, see which is best for you. And then finally, there's a lot of things I think that need to be solved in terms of management. Um, so getting all good auditing so you understand um, what is being changed as you, as you roll up new updates to your machine learning predictions <coughs> um, and you put out new versions basically. And to, also to get good um, data provenance, so how do you know for each prediction which was the data, which was the training model that was used to, as part of the model to, to create that prediction. That's key for any um, sort of business that needs to have good auditing, understanding what's happening in their flow. And secondly, you want to really tie it into CI, CD. Um, so you, you want to, sure it's machine learning, but you want to tie it into your standard um, Jenkins or Travis flows that you're using your organization, and so it can fit in really easily. 
and I'll discuss some techniques um, that come out like um, GitOps, which came out as a concept that's been made popular by Weaveworks in, in the last um, um, few months. So secondly, some things that we're also concentrating on is we don't want, in terms of machine learning prediction, we don't want to um, limit what tools your data scientists use for training. So you, they can use any tools they want, TensorFlow, SkyKit-Learn, uh, Spark, etc. And really, we just want to focus on the deployment side. So you allow people to easily use whichever tools they're using now, and then put the runtime inference part and deploy that. And as part of that runtime inference, we want to allow people to be very flexible in terms of the actual runtime graphs they deploy. So not just single models, but also A-B tests and multi arm bandits to push traffic in real time um, to, to the best models, and to separate out feature normalization and feature, feature transformations, and to add in complex analytics into the runtime run graph, like concept drift, so to, to determine whether um, your accuracy is dropping over time, um, so you can therefore change the model, um, and other things like bias detection, which is obviously key, and outlier detection. And some of these are in part of our open source right now, um, so you can use that um, to create reasonably complex graphs at one, uh, at one time. Um, so this is the top high-level view of the architecture. So obviously you've got your Kubernetes cluster, um, and you use the standard Kubernetes API, so that helps your DevOps, because they don't have to change the practices they use. They can use the standard kubectl um, commands, or they can use other techniques they're using, like Helm or Ksonic, to push their uh, machine learning deployments out there. Um, so we have an operator that listens to a, a new resource type um, that's describing your runtime graph. It sees that resource type and then will manage and build up to the underlying infrastructure the, that comes as part of Kubernetes, so the deployments, the services, et cetera, all built up and managed for you um, and put out there. And we have an extra component called an engine, which is going to manage that resource, that um, predict and so that, um, sorry, that request and a response flow through the graph. Um, and as part of that, we then ex expose gRPC or REST out there, and we have our own um, API server that's running as part of uh, the project, but we're also heavily looking into tools, tools like Ambassador, which is a great sort of reverse proxy um, that basically uh, um, allows you to plug in any auth authentication you want into your um, um, API, and it automatically spots um, just via so annotations on your running resources and then exposes them automatically to your external apps. So that means you can put in any authentication you want. You can use OAuth, you could use Google IAP, et cetera, and you can choose what you want. So really what we're looking for is flexibility here, basically. Um, so just to give some examples of like complex graphs and what I'm talking about in that area. So obviously you have the simple situation where you just have a single model and you have the request coming in from the left, the API, and response coming back out. But then maybe you want to make it more complex, maybe you want to change that graph in real time with no downtime to an A-B test with your, with your new model that you want to check. Or maybe you want to do something more um, complex and change that to like a multi arm bandit. So a, a multi arm bandit, for those who don't know, is, is basically it's looking at the feedback coming in and deciding which of your models is actually running best and pushing traffic to the model that's basically running best in real time. And it keeps monitoring the other model to see if things change and pushes traffic back to the other model if that's doing best. So we want to allow people to basically create these complex graphs and, and change them and push them out at, um, with no downtime. Maybe you want to separate out your feature transformations into a separate component um, and put that as a separate Docker container because that uh, would allow you to then maybe use that feature transformations between different projects in your uh, teams and um, uh, work on that separately. Add in outlier detection as a separate model, so that would be looking at the requests coming in, maybe adding some metadata as it comes back to say, okay, this request was an outlier, and, and you can feed that into what you're doing. And maybe doing more complex things that we've also worked on, like trying to explain the prediction. So maybe one of your, maybe your model is like a neural network that's very hard to explain um, to stakeholders outside, um, to sort of human beings basically, as to what features it was using to actually get a good prediction. And you can use techniques that we've worked on to try and get a high level understanding for a particular prediction. Um, um, what were the features that actually were the most influential in giving the response for this prediction. So basically the idea is we want to allow people to, to easily iterate between complex graphs. Maybe in the end you go back to just having a single model and that's fine, but, you, but to, to, to give people the flexibility to basically iterate between things is, is, is one of the things we're trying to do. So basically we have a set of core components, models, routers, combiners, transformers, which are, which are abstract um, definitions with a microservice API. And basically then people can build up and use those components as, as they see fit. So obviously the key thing would be the model, that would be the standard thing the data scientists would work on, but you can build up multi-arm bandits, transformers into, into this, just 
by conforming to the API, which is, and then build it up and build the thing, uh, put everything together into the runtime graph. So this is um, a description of, uh, this is an uh, example rather of a um, seldom deployment manifest. Um, so it's standard Kubernetes JSON or YAML. Um, um, and the components I'll, I'll show you now. So one part is the graph. This is, so there's a graph definition where you define that graph I showed you in the previous slide, that, what you want to do. In this case, it's very simple. It's just a single um, item that, that you want to do. Then you have a standard piece of Kubernetes where you put the pod template spec, which is where you define all your standard Kubernetes stuff, like what was the image, what, what does it require? Does it require GPUs? Um, does it require like a volume, so NFS volume that it needs to attach to? Um, how much memory and CPU, and that's, and that's pretty much standard Kubernetes that we, we just put in there. And so, therefore, um, that can all be um, um, sorted out at runtime. Obviously, then you define the number of replicas, how many copies of this uh, deployment graph do you want to put out there. And finally, we, we allow you to do multiple of, uh, prediction graphs. So this is cases where I'll show you where this is useful in a second. So not just one graph, but several in parallel that you want to have running. Um, so scenarios where you'd want to have more complex um, um, graphs together running would be like a sort of canary deployment. So this, if you don't know, this is the case where you say you have your standard deployment running, so the 10 replicas of your deployment, and you're very risk averse. You want to slowly see if, if, if the new model that you're going to put out there is going to cause any problems. So what you do is you, you create a separate deployment, which is completely isolated from, from the other one, and maybe it's just running with one replica. So it's going to, it's going to get a certain amount of the traffic, and then you can test out if that's going to fall over in production, exactly you know, whether it's going to cause any issues. And then finally, if you're happy with that, you can then do a rolling update. So just to clarify, so the standard thing would be to just do a rolling update. So if you had, say, 100, or 100 replicas of your um, graph, it would slowly um, drain down uh, uh, the 100 replicas of your previous graph and add in the new graph as it was going. So that's fine, but for people who want to be risk averse, maybe you want to do it in this way so you don't touch things and you just put out the graph that you want to run bef before that. And we, we can do that because we have that sort of set of predictions, as I showed in the previous um, graph, that you can define. Another common scenario that people talk about is blue-green deployments. So here you have your 10 replicas or 100 or whatever of your model running. And then basically you just create a separate set of infrastructure that's going to run your new model, also at the same size, and wait until you're happy that that's all running. Maybe it's loaded all the model parameters, etc. And then when you're finally happy that it's actually run, you then do the switch over. Obviously, the disadvantage to that is that you need twice the amount of infrastructure size in your cluster to, to manage that. But for some people, um, if you're very risk averse and you wanted to check things out, that's the best situation, we, and we handle that as well. A final one is um, some customers have asked, asked us for this, where you have shadow deployments, which is where you want to just split the traffic as it comes in between two graphs, but not actually get the response from the second model. So you want to try it out in production but you don't want to um, send the response back and just check whether it's working OK, um, but not uh, on, on the same traffic that the real model is seeing, and just try to monitor it. And uh, that's also uh, covered. So the other thing I just want to go over quickly is um, we want to make, be completely agnostic in terms of how data scientists, what they use. And basically, to put your runtime graph into um, Selden Core, you just need to do two things. You just need to turn it into a Docker container and expose it to the microservice API. So it's not actually that difficult, but we want to make it really easy. So we're integrating things like Red Hat's OpenShift source to image, which basically allows you to uh, use a tool which points to a source code repo on GitHub or, or locally. And using a build image that we, we supply, it, it packages everything up for you all in one command line. So this makes it very easy for data scientists to actually package up their runtime graph um, without many problems. I'll just give some very quick examples that are part of the code. You can, you can look at this if you, if you wish. So Python models is just one line using our Python builder image to um, package that. As a, as a Python user, the runtime part, you just define a Python class with a predict method that, that takes a um, NumPy array. Um, and then you can add a requirements.txt to add in all your dependencies. And you just define, OK, this is where the class is in Iris classifier. It's going to, it needs a REST interface, um, and it's, in this case, it's um, actually a model. That's all we need. And then using S2I, <coughs> we actually package it up and add all, add, add all your requirements in, and that's it. Build the image, and then you can push it to your repo and put it in, and put those images as part of your graph. And we do very similar things with R. So we have a very similar case where you can just put the R model in, the, the actual dependencies, and do another um, S2I single line 
um, just with the um, R builder image and um, run that and create the image for you. And same for Java models, we're, we're working on that right now and that'll be out probably next week. You define a Spring class um, and do an interface and do the same thing, just one line. So really, it, there isn't much effort using these tools to allow your one-time, your data scientist to take the one-time code and create it into images, which then can be packaged and put into the graph. So really, as I said, the key steps are really three parts. You package your, your image for your runtime component. You describe your deployment in the graph, and in future, we'll have a graphical interface that we're working on, which will probably be closed source, but part of the open source of the command lines, you're using JSON and YAML, and then you deploy it using the standard Kubernetes API, um, and then um, so monitor it, and then go through that loop of updating your models and testing and getting further understandings of what's happening. So in terms of what's available for the external APIs that you tie your business apps into, there's two methods, predict and feedback. So predict is, as you would expect, to send, send in to get predictions. And to make it completely general, we um, allow you to send in either tensors, which are, which are just a shape set of floats, the same as TensorFlow serving. Or you can send NDOAs, which would be the case if you want to do sort of more natural language processing. We have multi-type um, information that you want to send in, uh, and it's easier to use in sort of JSON situations where you're using the REST API. Or you can just send in any custom custom string or binary, but in those cases you then have the limitation that some of the other um, modules like outlier detection and stuff that are part of the, that are part of the open source at the, at the moment um, won't understand what's, what they're seeing going through, so you, you can't use it in those scenarios. And then there's an optional feedback um, API endpoint, and that's for, the, that's for use of things like multi-armed bandits where you're sending in, okay, this, this request was correct, this, this response I got back was incorrect, and then you can use things like multi-armed bandits or concept drift to try to analyze what's going on with your machine learning. And so finally, um, all this has to be tied into standard CI CD, and so we really um, like the idea of GitOps, which is basically taking the source control as the source of truth. So you'd have two source control repos, one for your deployment descriptions written in Kubernetes, um, declarative descriptions, and one for your code. And then basically the idea is you just fire off, as commits come into those repos, you, you fire off things completely from that, your, your CI pipeline, and your um, continuous delivery using tools like Reflux or Case on it and stuff to tie it all together. And so it really creates a nice pipeline and it allows you to also then do auditing and versioning very easily. So if things go wrong, as you're just using source control to fire everything off, you can just go back to the previous version and get, put that into production. And also for things like um, auditing, you can just, as it's all source control and it's all declarative, which is a great thing about Kubernetes, it's all declarative desc of the descriptions of what my infrastructure is going to what I want my infrastructure to be, you could then just do simple checks in your source code between what, was, what, what has the data scientist changed? Okay, I see they've added more memory, et cetera, uh, et cetera to that. And you can easily tie that into, into your um, like approval process. So finally, just the roadmap, um, where we're doing, we, we want to concentrate on low latency. We're we'll talking to people like NVIDIA to make sure we can tie into the things like TensorRT, which is like optimized, um, tens, um, op optimized, to check your TensorFlow graph and optimize it, basically, so it runs um, with maximum throughput on, like, NVIDIA GPUs of different types. Um, predictive batching, that's a great thing in TensorFlow serving, and we want to put that into what we're doing, and um, that, and, and definitely data provenance, which probably isn't so much in there. We allow people to add arbitrary metadata to the, response, the requests and responses, but definitely want to do that, because that's very key for some of our um, sort of FinTech customers uh, to uh, work well and handle um, distributed graphs. So some parts you might want to put on certain hardware of your graph and other parts on different hardware and, 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 distribute, and um, um, distribute that out in the best way. And handle things like service meshes like Istio to handle maybe parts of the graph um, in a good way. And finally, yes, yeah, so as I said, we're going to sell and deploy, which would be a high level product um, that allows you to do this in a more graphical way because obviously the open source is very low level. So thank you. Thank you. Any questions from the audience? Any comments? Something you would like to discuss? Just, you might want to just stay, stay right up. Speak uh, loud. Thank you very much for a nice talk. Uh, I have a, just a question on the, what method do you use for the explanations uh, of your predictions? Uh, is it a written gradient or a method you should have used or something like that? Um, yes, yeah, so in terms of how you would use it, and the explanations, it's really for um, complex non-linear um, sort of non models where you, it's very hard to get an interpretation of what features are actually 
being used as part of the result. And sometimes you want to take those models and say to stakeholders, human beings, OK, we think this was what the model was doing and it was using these features. And so it gives confidence to the human beings that have to approve to put your mach machine learning out. So especially in sort of fintech use cases, they're very um, risk averse. So if they have a model that basically looks like a black box that they don't understand, it might be great in terms of accuracy. But if they can't give a good explanation as to what's going on to people higher level up, they're not going to get that approved. So that would be one use. But the restriction with these, these are normally quite um, um, slow to use. They normally, the standard technique, techniques would be to actually um, sort of, um, so sort of perturbate the feature values to see how the prediction is changing as you change certain features. And so therefore you need to run several thousand um, different feature requests through your model by taking the particular example you want to explain and s slowly sort of perturbating different, uh, different uh, items to see how which is, which is changing the most. So, so yeah, I mean, there were interesting techniques. There's a lot of techniques like Lime is, is, is one that was very popular. It's come out a few years ago. And so yeah, there's a lot of work being done that for these reasons that I've said. Any, any other question? I have one last one. You build an open source machine learning framework, basically, and you deploy this with enterprises, right? So what is the personal lesson learned that you have implementing, you know, you know helping enterprises, for example, in finance, you know, using such an open source, you know, machine learning framework? I mean, I think it's, it's really just to give them the, the confidence of, of making the choice. I mean, in terms of going from the closed source world to the open source world, which give them the confidence that they should look into give that flexibility to the data scientists, so the data scientists have the flexibility within the organization to choose what components. I think Qflow and ourselves are allowing that flexibility um, to, to give a much more open way of viewing data science. And also, they do like the um, fact that they can customize areas, you know, because these are very flexible licenses. So they can take various areas and, and customize them for their own use cases as well. Awesome. Then? Thanks, Clive. Okay, great. Thanks Thank for you. being here. Thank you. So, next up on stage will be Paul Peterson. He's a CIO of um, Big ML. And um, after setting up the laptop, which should be quick and easy, <laughs> hopefully, <laughs> you will tell us a little bit more about how you predicted the Oscar winners in 2018, right? That's right. Cool. Awesome. Let's let's go. Yep. We just I have to stay right here, is that the idea? I'm constrained. I feel very constrained now. Okay, so the Oscars, what's the big deal? Okay, first of all, I have an agenda. That's my joke. Uh, so I'll give you just a mercifully quick biograph. Okay, my name is Paul Peterson, CIO for Brigham the I for infrastructure. Okay, so if you want to geek out about computers and stuff like that, I'm your guy. Um, does anybody here know what Big ML is? You guys familiar at all? I'm not going to go into a long try of detail. It's just for my own personal benefit. I want to know. Just curious. So I have a background in mathematics, physics, and engineering. I was really, I had a hard time choosing, apparently. Uh, and I love computers and teaching. Those are my fields. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about predicting the winning movies of the Oscars for 2018. I'm going to show you what we did, why this is possible at all, exactly how we did it, OK, sh short of actually demoing, uh, and showing how this is a blueprint for applying machine learning to whatever problem you want to solve. And I quoted anything, because you can't really solve anything, but it's close and some fun extra stuff if we don't run out of time. OK, so predicting the Oscars. So on March 1st, 2018, that's before the Oscar winners were announced, we posted this blog post where we uh, predicted six categories. So we predicted the winners for, uh, it's a little hard to read on the screen, but best picture, best director, best actress, uh, best actor, best supporting actress, and best supporting actor. All right, and a few days later on Sunday evening, the uh, winners were announced. So how did we do? Well. There you go. <laughs> we got six out of six right. OK, it's a pretty good track record. Um, we actually got eight out of eight, OK? But there were two that the, the probability was a little too low. We didn't feel like we could publish it. You know, we, wanted to have a, we wanted to have a six out of six instead of a seven out of eight. But we actually got eight out of eight. Uh, the two that we actually also got right were adapted screenplay and original screenplay. So we nailed those two. Now, this created a lot of excitement, as you can imagine. Um, people have a very short attention span on the internet, so there's a lot of tweeting that went on. 
Uh, so yay, machine learning. Uh, I love some of these. Okay, there's no doubt that I skimmed the Oscars. You know, nailed the prediction game. Uh, I like this one too. Power of machine learning confirmed. Because we need, had to predict the Oscars before people knew machine learning was cool, right? Okay, uh, what if there was a way, wait, we did it, okay. Uh, and then there was this one too, which actually I'm gonna spend just a minute derailing you on. Oops, I didn't let you read it, did I? That's okay. So this, this guy was saying, well, wait, if that's true, why can't we predict lottery numbers? We have winning history data available online. <laughs> okay, but if you think about it for a minute, it's actually kind of a valid question, right? I mean, people think of the Oscars as being this random thing. So let's break it down a little bit, contrapositive time. Okay, what are we talking about here? So his assertion is that if we can predict the Oscars, we can predict lottery numbers. Okay, you know, you can flip that around. You can say, well, we can't predict lottery numbers, then we can't predict the Oscars. That would be the result of his assertion if he is proved true, correct? Okay, uh, now we know we can't predict lottery numbers because otherwise there'd be this one team out there with some really cool machine learning algorithm and they'd be billionaires by now. So they'd be predicting them all. So we know that this is some kind of a contradiction. Okay, so you can't predict lottery numbers. I'm sure you know this. So there's two main problems here why this isn't gonna work. First of all, the motion in these typical machines is chaotic. If you don't know what chaos means, it's just extremely nonlinear. All right, so little tiny changes in the initial conditions greatly change the outcome. All right, the ball moves over a billionth of an inch and it's a totally different number. Okay, and you can't measure the initial conditions with infinite precision anyways. Thanks, Heisenberg. Okay, so why can we predict the Oscars? Why are they so different? Well, let's think about it for a minute. How do you actually win an Oscar? Well, there's this voting body of the Academy. It's over 7,000 members and they vote. And then there's a, one of the you know, best, one of the categories is chosen, okay? So don't we have the same problem as the lottery with predicting intention? Aren't people's brains like some kind of a computer that if you knew the exact state, you can figure out exactly where they're gonna vote? And that would be impossible, right? Well, what if we build movie watching robots? I know somebody out there is thinking about this. This is how we'll do it. So we'll program robots to record audio and video. Okay, there's the Mystery Science Theater 3000, if you don't know that reference. I will train them to react like a human to the movie. Okay, we'll train the, these big neural networks, and then we'll run a simulation and collect votes. you will do like an alpha zero here. Okay, we'll just run movie, 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 movie. Okay, please don't try to solve everything with AI and machine learning. This is the totally wrong approach. That's a big hammer that uh, isn't even driving a nail in this case. Uh, so, if you haven't ever thought about evaluating your machine learning approaches, here's a nice little chart to do it. So on the y-axis there, we have uh, increasing data availability or decreasing complexity, all right? And on the bottom, we have the ROI, the impact and cost. Okay, anything down in that corner is a no-go, okay? The data is either just not available or the problem is super complex and the ROI is close to zero, so you just don't bother in that space. Anything up there, maybe the data becomes available or it gets easier later, so you postpone that problem. Hope you can solve it again. Okay, something over here has a high ROI. It's very interesting but the data is not available, it's complex. That's something you gotta think about. Maybe you can do it still. And then in the upper corner there, that's, that's the sweet spot, right? Things that are gonna benefit your business and you've already got all the data, it's just sitting there and all you gotta do is throw some machine learning at it. No brainers. Okay, the movie watching robots is down there somewhere. Okay, I gave it a little bump in ROI because if you actually manage to make a movie watching robot, it's probably gonna be useful for something else. Okay, watching movies would be the last thing it does. Um, okay, so what if we just guess? Let's just try guessing. So we got one of nine for best picture, one of five, one of five, one of five, one of five. Okay, that's not gonna work either, right? Too many combinations. Okay, so why is this gonna work? Let's think about coins for a minute. This will make sense, I promise. <laughs> so we'll take our coin, okay, we'll flip it, and we get tails, we'll flip it again, maybe we'll get heads, and we flip it a bunch more times, right? Okay, so after observing these first five flips, what is the probability that flip six is heads? You guys didn't know this would be a math class, did you? I'm sorry. Hopefully nobody's having a heart attack. What's the probability that that last is a, is a heads? It's a half, yeah, it's 50%, exactly. Okay, as I stated the problem, I was very careful when I wrote it, uh, these events are independent, okay? So the previous flips don't matter, all right? They don't matter, with one caveat. Uh, what if it wasn't a fair coin? Uh, there's a lot of tails there, and this is what humans do. They're like, you know, there's a, there's, there's a lot of tails. There's three and or four, it only was head one. What if your coin is cheating? then the probability is low, okay? Well, but this actually gets us onto the idea here, the movies are not equally likely to be best, best picture. They don't all have equal probability. So how do we know? 
Well, we could look at other wins, right? We could say, okay, The Shape of Water wins a BAFTA award, and then it wins a Golden Globe, and then it wins a Director's Guild. Well, it doesn't win the Writer's Guild, that's okay, but it also wins the London Critics. Yeah, notice the reference there. Uh, and then uh, will, will it win the Oscar? Okay, well, these events are not independent. Okay, these are not coin tosses. They're similar but not identical factors that contribute to each one of these wins. The quality of the acting, the quality of the writing, whether or not you rub elbows with all these same people and they're like, hey, you got to vote for it because, you know, my cousin worked on this movie. Who knows? There's a billion factors that are all going to correlate these. So we can expect a higher probability for Shape of Water to win the Oscar. That's the basic idea. Okay. So where do we start? So we have step one, let's predict the Oscars, and uh, step finish is here are the predicted winners. Uh, people like to think about this. This is basically all the further tweets go. Yay, we can predict cancer. Nobody ever tells you how hard it was, okay, or how many failed neural networks they built. Um, so what is even step two? How do you get there? And it doesn't, you know, it doesn't have to be the Oscars. It could be, hey, let's predict some customer return. Here are the customers we predict will leave our service. What do you do tomorrow? Okay. So the first thing is to state this problem as a machine learning task, all right? So what does that mean? Well, you gotta be specific, okay? Let's predict the Oscars. And no, <laughs> no, no. Let's predict the Oscars by correlating a series of award wins with the final Oscar win. Yes, okay, that's very specific. Now you know exactly what you're gonna do, okay? This often requires iteration, it takes a little bit of playing. I know I've been working with the uh, pre-series model for the battle, and I went through many iterations. Okay, typically this is about 10% of your overall effort in this project. It's not too bad, but it can be involved depending on how hard it is to describe the problem. Then you gotta do some data wrangling. What's that? Does it involve a horse? No. Uh, so where are you gonna get your data from? Um, how bad is the data? It's gonna be full of errors and typos and bad fields and all kinds of data is horrible. Can you access it with an API because you don't want fresh data and you don't wanna have to do, you know, type it all or by, type it in by again, again by hand. Uh, then you're gonna have to do some transformations. Okay, your machine learning data needs to be rows and columns, uh, unless of course it isn't, right? You could imagine images or audio files or some other things. But for the majority of problems, it's just gonna be some rows and columns and every row is an instance of something you're trying to learn something about, like a movie. Okay, and it needs to be denormalized, right? One big fat table. So there tends to be lots of nasty work to do in there. And so in fact, actually, this is the data that we harvested from the uh, IMDB. I hope that doesn't violate the terms of agreement. I didn't actually check. Um, so we have things like about the movie, like the year and the, uh, the rating, the genre, it, even the gross and the release date and all that kind of stuff. And then there's data about all the different awards that they've won. And then there's the objective fields over there, which are all the different categories of Oscars that we're interested in predicting. Okay, not too bad so far. So then there's going to be a little bit of feature engineering. You knew that was coming, right? So machine learning is sensitive to good features. Sometimes you give it a slightly different way of looking at the data and then suddenly it finds all the patterns and works perfectly. Uh, it might need better features. It might need even completely new ones. And that the whole block there, those three things are about 80% of the entire project. Pain, 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 pain. Um, now I will tell you that because there's pain there, there's of course market opportunity. And so I assure you that Big ML is bringing something cool into that 80% effort. Watch for it. It's going to be cool. Okay. So predicting the Oscars. Uh, now this data set that we built, Okay, when that 80% pain is actually available, there's the URL right there, there's a gallery you can go out to, you can clone it, you can play with it a lot as well. So you don't have to do the 80% work if you want to play with this data set. I did it for you. Okay, so finally the machine learning part, which is easy, right? What algorithm we're gonna use? Okay, now I'm gonna give you a little algorithm selection guideline. Okay, this is my personal preference. Okay, so we have on two axes, I just like doing these graphs, I guess. So as we go down on the x-axis there, we have decreasing interpretability, but better representational power, uh, and we pay for it in longer training times, okay? And in the y-axis, we have increasing data size or maybe complexity, okay, more complicated data or bigger data. Okay, we're gonna break this graph up into three stages. We have the early stage, we're doing what we call rapid prototyping, and mid-stage, or like a proven application, something we know is gonna work, and late-stage critical performance. And the idea is that when you're in this uh, rapid prototyping, you don't even know if you're gonna be able to predict the Oscars. You have no idea if it's gonna work, it could fail. Okay, so you're not gonna whip out a deep neural network to do that stage, because that's, you def, it's hard to interpret, right? That graph down there, decreasing interpretability. So you start with something like a logistic regression, or just a single decision tree, because they're very easy to understand what it's doing, how it's making its decisions, super easy to interpret. Once you can see that there's actually some signal in there that you're learning from, then you move up to this mid-stage, where you start looking at decision force or random decision force. Still somewhat easy to interpret, much more powerful, and often you can actually just stop there. But sometimes you have a critical performance, like predicting cancer, 
And so now I might move to a boosted tree with a really small learning rate, or you might pull out a deep neural network and do that. Okay, also again, depending on your data size or complexity. Okay? Got a couple of pictures there. All right, so modeling evaluations. Um, I put those together, so what about evaluations? So all models are wrong, but some are useful. Keep that in mind. They're never 100%. Okay, so we have our data set for these, these movies, 119 variables. And it's actually from uh, 2000, 2016. No, that's right. Uh, and the first thing we're going to do is we're going to split it. So we're going to make one data set that's 2000 to 2012. And we're going to train a deep neural network, actually, uh, using all the movies from 2000 to 2012. And then we're going to pipe the uh, 2013 to 2016 movies through there and see whether or not it predicts the right winners for the Oscars. Okay, so we do a little four-year test. All right, we actually did do this. Uh, and for all the award categories, we retained an ROC, AUC, of over 0 0.98. Okay, so it's very, very successful. Uh, which means that the models were able to predict these winners for four consecutive years with very few errors. And that actually is the confusion matrix there, which you probably can't quite read. But trust me, it looks really good. Okay, it's quite good. Okay, so modeling evaluations. Um, now we're going to go to predictions. Don't forget to retrain with all the data, right? We split to see how it was doing, but now we're going to predict for real. We want to predict this year's winner, so you've got to go back and use the whole data set. And then we're going to use the whole data set to make predictions. So here we go. We're going to build a model per objective. We'll create a prediction for each candidate. So we take our full data set, we run it through, and build a nice deep neural network. Then we take the movie for this year, feed it in there. It tells us if it's going to win and what probability it's going to win. And then we choose the highest probability. Piece of cake. OK, so how did we do? Well, best picture, we predicted the shape of water with a so each one of these probability scores, they don't add up to one, okay? They're individual movies. But you can see how much uh, the model preferred this movie over the others. Okay, the next closest score was a 68. Uh, the, sh the Shape of Water for Best Director, Guillermo del Toro. The 75 there, pretty much trounced everybody. 99 is definitely a solid win. 88, solid win. 64, so we feel pretty good about these. They're all very solid and correct. <laughs> okay? Now, wait a minute. I put the uh, modeling evaluations and predictions all at 5% effort, right? How can you have 5% effort for a deep neural network? Those are hard, right? You guys work with neural networks at all? Yeah, are they hard? Eh, can, you know, can your mom do it? Eh, yeah. Okay, let me just, uh, I'm gonna switch to blue because this is deep, okay? Sorry about that. So th I'll just give you super brief very quick overview, right? So you've got some inputs there. You've got some classes up there that we're trying to predict. Deep neural network is going to have some magic hidden layer. Could have more than one, of course. And there's some activation function that takes all the input features, predicts the uh, H, H nodes there, and then they're all summed together with some other activation function, perhaps, to compute the output nodes. I'm going very fast, I know. Okay, and then the game is that what we call these hidden features. And now the game is that we say, well, you know, we can change the activation function. We can add a whole bunch more layers. Each one of those layers can have a bunch more nodes. This turns into a big quagmire of possibilities. All right, you have 8,000 layers and 2,000 nodes or whatever. All right, so what do you do? Okay, well, the problem is that the success is dependent on getting the right structure. If you choose the wrong structure, it's not like it's just like mostly good. You know, it's usually like really bad until you get the right structure, and then it's really fantastic. Okay, so there's not a lot of room for error on this. And there are just too many parameters to be that right. So, and taking the, setting them correctly takes expert knowledge. Okay. So the solution, there's two things that we do for you. One is meta-learning. So we start with a good initial guess, and the other is we do a network search. All right? So uh, that's the expression, right? We trained 300,000 models, so you don't have to. Uh, but basically, we took a bunch of different data sets. We trained a whole bunch of neural networks, figure out which ones are the right, right one, the best ones, uh, and then the optimal structure. And then we trained a model, which when you give it a new data set, it looks at the structure of the data set and predicts the ideal structure. Meta-learning. We just use machine learning again. Okay, so we can use this directly or as a seed for more intensive network search. So how does that work? Well, we take our seed and we just try. We go, okay, well, that one gets a score of 0.75, that one's a 0.48. We just build a bunch of these network structures, and then we use a little Bayesian parameter optimization, and we can get an even better network structure. Uh, and actually what we do is we create, I think by default, 128, and then we do a little bit of stacking as well. So the neural networks all kind of work together. Okay, and the result of all this is that if you just take an off-the-shelf algorithm across a wide variety of data sets, 
And uh, so you've got all kinds of things here, like gradient boosting and naive bays and add a boost and k-nearest neighbors and stuff. So the deep neural networks are over there. And that's just for a one-click network search, no configuration, push a button, get a neural network, and it beats everything. And that's what we wanted to do. Okay, so that's how that can be a 5% effort. Uh, now, I went pretty fast. So I want to come back to the unfair coin, because there's another little fun side note. So what if, you, what if you knew that you had a fair coin? This is bonus material, sorry. <laughs> and you wanted to see if another coin was fair. Well, one thing you could do is actually just flip them a bunch of times. And I have this great picture. I, I, set my, uh, I have a seven-year-old son. I set him flipping a coin and uh, recording it. And I have a whole table, and then I played with the data set. So I did this for real. Uh, and then you could you just label them. You say, OK, well, this coin was fair, and this other coin is the one I'm testing. All right, that's the idea. Oh, so it says label the fair and unknown. You might have to do a little feature engineering there. I left a little room. You might need number of heads and number of tails to make this work perfectly. But the idea is you build a model to predict whether it's fair or test. And we expect this model to fail. Okay, if they're both fair coins, it shouldn't be able to tell them apart. That's the idea. If it can tell them apart, then the new coin is not fair. Does that make sense? Yeah? If these distributions are significantly different, it'll tell them apart. And then the coins aren't both fair. Now, this is something called covariate shift, which you can also use uh, for knowing when you need to retrain your models. Okay? So you can actually take your data set that you've trained and the data set of all the predictions you're making, combine them together, and you can look for when the input data is shifting away from your training data. Okay. Anyways, bonus material. My apologies. So that was the Oscars. <laughs> At rapid speed. You said 20 Thanks minutes. very much. Yeah, it's perfect. It's exactly yeah. 20 minutes. That's what I was expecting. <laughs> I've predicted that it took 10 minutes, right? So, um, any questions for the guy with the company that can predict Oscars and maybe some other things in the future, right? No? Oh, you again. But now you can like, right? <laughs> I got bashed before, right? Uh, can you tell us a bit more about the, um, uh, what are the features that you use for the prediction? Uh, the 100 and, uh, I don't remember, yeah, 20, the, and, and uh, how many samples? Because uh, there is this uh, expectation that deep neural nets are not competitive uh, if you don't have that many training set, uh, samples. Yeah, that's a lie. Yeah, <laughs> okay. Yeah, no, it, it, it depends on the data. So this data set, I, um, I forget, it has 119 features and uh, 1,000 some odd rows. Um, I lost it. Yeah, I think it was uh, 1,200 rows, I think, and 119 features. So the features is each row is a movie, and it has all the metadata about the movie, the release date, the gross, uh, you know, the rating, the is it PG-13 or whatever, and then it has all of the awards that it's won, like the all the like examples I showed, like the BAFTA and the London Critics Circle and all the rest of those. It's all in there, and then there's a final. Actually, I'll just show it to you. <laughs> so. If you go out to the gallery and hit data sets here on the footer there and scroll down a little bit, it should show up pretty, pretty quick. There it is, Movies 2017, and you can just dra grab this out of here. And now you can play with this too. And so I'll make this a little bigger. And now you can see, okay, here's the Oscars. So those are all the Oscar Best Picture won. Each movie marked no, it didn't win, or yes, it did win, for example. Uh, and then there's, you know, the BAFTAs are all in here. BAFTA won, and the categories is actually in an items because it comes as a list, the categories that it won. It's, they do theirs a little differently, but you support these lists of items. And I think there's, you know, release date, gross, et cetera. Yeah, so it's 1,159 rows. Yep. Any other questions? No? Oh, yeah, there we go. Why are you so shy, guys? Nothing is happening. Yeah, so you, you have a wonderful example for, for prediction. Um, do you also do algorithms that can generate things, like can be images or, or whatever, with a generative algorithm like autoencoder or GANs or whatever? Ah, for the, for the neural networks. Yeah, so the, in the, uh, for the neural networks, we actually just recently released the deep nets feature. And it's only for uh, uh, classification and regression right now. But we are bringing image analysis as well. So that'll be soon. 
Yeah, but specifically what you're asking for, no, not yet. Yep. Any other question? I have one. <laughs> sure. Um, out of this 80% work that you mentioned, right, what is, you know, can you give us a hint into the future? What is the lesson learned out of this work that might help the audience, the other practitioners to apply, you know, similar predictions on other, you know, maybe more relevant, right, <laughs> applications yeah, or use it's cases? Still, it's, it's interesting because even until recently, there weren't even a lot of books about how to do, you know, denormalization from machine learning, right? And, and there are a few now, but it's always been kind of a black art. Uh, especially creating features or knowing what features you, you might want to create. And uh, I teach a class where I have a bunch of examples, but they won't make sense speaking them out loud. They're, they're easier to show. Um, but a lot of that, I mean, some of it is repeatable and reusable, and it's just, it's an area of active research. There's some, been some papers recently on uh, deep fe feature synthesis, right? Uh, and so, you know, there's, some, there's a lot of stuff going on actively um, that will make that much easier, that aspect, at least bring that 80% down a little bit. There, I, I certainly, at least in my mind, having played with it, with what, uh, or having spoken to Ken about what he's working on, because I haven't seen it yet, uh, there's still a lot to be done. I mean, it's not going to be perfect, but it makes it better. Yeah, much easier. Let's get okay. it down to 40%. Let's say. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Oh, one more question. Yeah, regarding the um, uh, search through uh, possible architecture until you find the, the best one. Um, do you just apply a grid search or do you have any kind of um, base optimization or yeah. any kind of That's other? exactly it. It's, it's a, a Bayesian search. Yep. Cool. Then Paul, thanks very much. Yep. Give him a hand and um, yeah, hope to see you again in, at 3 p.m. for the next session. Thank you.
to Fried goes first. HDMI? This one, this, uh, I forgot what it's called. Yes. All right. Um, good afternoon. We are, um, all right, we've got two more startups um, from that AI startup battle, so that's four in total. And again, five minute pitches, and then uh, we'll move on to a panel discussion, a couple of presentations, and then back to the AI startup battle, uh, the battle itself. Um, so yeah, uh, our next startup is uh, TensorFlight, and uh, I'll let them introduce themselves. Thank you. Uh, thank Thank you for letting me uh, be here and present uh, Startup TensorFlight. So what we focus on is remote worldwide property inspection using uh, deep learning, machine learning, computer vision. So uh, the team uh, founders, it's me and Robert. So we both used to work in uh, these companies, Microsoft, Google, Facebook. Uh, and we thought that um, actually there is a lot of um, talents being um, sucked away from Poland and we believe that there could be like very strong Polish uh, Polish company on Polish rules that um, you know we could uh, leverage all the all the talents there and build the product on our own uh, our own um, terms so uh, I used to work uh, in computer vision quite a lot. In 2015, we had uh, beaten together with Google team uh, image and benchmark. In 2016, uh, top one uh, MS Coco detection benchmark. In 2017, with UCL uh, students, we had the best second model for mammography detect for mam for cancer detection in mammograms. Uh, Robert, on the other hand, is expert of scalability and uh, bringing solution uh, to the cloud in such a way that today we are able to process the whole. Uh, U.S. Um, in in in, num in hours. Our advisors are very um, top um, AI people. So uh, Peter Abil, uh, he's the he's the professor who brought deep learning into robotics, and Kyung Kyung Cho is the uh, professor from NYU, who is uh, you know in in his in his age is uh, there is no other person with so many uh, high uh, scored um, publications. So what is the problem that we solve? Um, reinsurance players, uh, this is the, the market that we target in the first place, uh, these are huge companies that insure another insurance companies. And uh, they get quotes of size 50, 100, 200K buildings at once to insure against the catastrophic risk. And usually because of uh, such scale of, of, of the quote, they are not able to process and to possess the data about all these buildings uh, one by one. So like sending a single uh, prof uh, professional who can inspect the property, this is cost around $100 per hour and it takes few hours. On the other hand, um, the, the, the catastrophic models, they need only like few pieces of information uh, about every building, but what is required is the coverage. So they would like to know the whole uh, Florida, for example, and, and uh, the, 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 all, the, all the buildings in the portfolio. So at the current stage, um, we see that they have some information about half of the buildings on average uh, from, from different data sources that we also collect. And, uh, other half is still untouched, and uh, we can increase their business by two times. And reinsurance business is like uh, really high value. Uh, is, insurance is the second biggest market worldwide after um, agriculture. Uh, we focus mostly on commercial properties. There is around 10 to 20 million uh, commercial properties in US. Uh, it's 10 times, 10 times less than um, the residential properties, but every piece of information is worth 10 times more because these are usually like more valuable buildings. 
And uh, what we focus is obviously this uh, catastrophic risk. So uh, the, the, the factors, the features that we look for are the ones that highly correlate with the, uh, with the catastrophes such as tornado, uh, hurricanes, earthquakes, f floods, uh, big fires. Uh, to give an example, um, if you have wooden building, it's better, uh, um, it's better suited for the earthquake because wood is elastic. On the other hand, uh, structured engineering is much better for, for to tornadoes because wooden building in Florida uh, would be uh, blown away easier. So how we build the product? Um, we focus on a satellite. Um, aerial imagery from airplanes, and street view perspective. So based on our models, we, uh, for every address that we get, we analyze the neighborhood of the address, we uh, extract the features and uh, risk factors coming from, from, from the neighborhood, like for example, trees or objects that could be pushed uh, into, into the building. Uh, then we um, we look at the at the site at the oblique perspective and extract information about um, about the buildings that can be visible on this side, and finally we uh, look into the street view perspective to uh, match together all this information to um, predict the features that are uh, the most interested to our uh, customers. And um, I can say that we already have like three pilots with the top free range insurance players in the United States, and we are uh, starting one here in London as well. Um, it's usually not often that you know two people start up. Currently, we are around 20 people, but uh, two people were able to get um, convince reinsurance to um, share data sets about their uh, addresses that they insure. Uh, what is the business model? Is actually. Um, relatively straightforward. So if there is like small uh, small requests, we usually charge few do few dollars per building. Uh, if someone asks for the uh, all buildings in US, um, we charge five million dollars, which probably would be two times cheaper than buying the data, just buying the data, uh, visual data to process it. Uh, so every reinsurance must be in if they uh, have a big uh, portfolios. Uh, then we have around up to 50 reinsurance players uh, worldwide. Let's say we sell to 20 of them, five million dollars, 100 million dollars uh, yearly recurring revenue. Uh, we um, um, like we've, we, we give the policy to use the data only over one year, uh, and every year we build new features that, that the models can be used uh, uh, that could like bring better risk um, estimation for these um, insurance and reinsurance players. And why we are different than competition? So in the first place, we don't we, fo we don't focus on residential. We focus on commercial. There is no single company that focuses on commercial properties today. Uh, we look at the street perspective, and we heavily invest in uh, computer vision. So we have few PhDs and a few representatives on from international Olympiads in informatics in our team. Thank you. All right, thank you. Um, I'm going to invite Tibli to come up on stage and why they get set up. Um, has anyone uh, got any questions for Zbigniew? Just one? Yep. Uh, he has a talk also tomorrow in the new, uh, machine learning from the trenches uh, track. Uh, thanks. Uh, uh, what are the terms to be able to use uh, Google Street View data for this kind of commercial? application uh, I mean you, ha you have to pay for it right so uh, obviously uh, if you would like to know who we work with directly we have to sign NDA uh, there is more than uh, Google who have this kind of data but uh, obviously we have to pay for the data sets all right okay cool. next up TV. thank you very much mm -hmm. Okay, um, good afternoon ladies and gentlemen, thanks for having me. Uh, my name is Philip, I'm the CEO and co-founder of Tiblu. Um, for us, many of us at least, this is reality, right? We are online wherever, whenever. Um, however, the businesses that we trust most, fiduciaries, lawyers, wealth managers or pension funds communicate with us still like it's 1999. And that's no wonder because they've been trained for a world that no longer exists. 
while legislation has for a long time prohibited them to move forward, now with new regulations and frameworks, they're actually pushing forward. And consumers, while putting up with the old ways for a very long time, now flock towards providers with digital offerings. And that puts about 80,000 businesses in the UK alone um, in front of massive problems. Because stemming the cost for implementing their own digital solutions is massive. And so for the, the struggle on a daily basis is real. They have to manage a multitude of channels. It's not just desktop email and a bit of paper anymore. Now they have to manage messenger, uh, SMS, sometimes Skype calls, etc. And then putting all of that back into their existing CRM systems. And which exact version does the customer now have? It has become a real issue. And that's where we saw an opportunity. And building a single point of contact between your client advisor and your customers. Think the best of Slack, WhatsApp, email, CRM, data management system, and yes, actually paper. So you and your client advisor, or your client advisor and your client, always have the same view of what has been decided, when and where. So you can actually have one ongoing conversation, one single source of truth. Because in the end, that's what it's all about, right? Having conversation, and in this context, more than ever, conversations that matter. So it's more than, or you can, sorry, uh, you should be able to focus on this conversation rather than having to file emails or sift through them just to find the right thing. That's why we take that away from these high trust businesses by offering fully digital onboarding, fully qualified digital signatures to sign contracts in seconds rather than days. And obviously all of that is encrypted, GDPR compliant, uh, locked and traceable, and ubiquitously available on every device that runs a browser. Now, this allows us to merge all the new ways. But the problem was a bit that the customers that we talk about, they have very old systems in place, sometimes 15 years old. There's nothing like a fancy API or big data access. So we had to fall back on one of the oldest industry standards, PDF. That's what all these systems generate before they send the data to print anyway. Now with Hebrew, you just upload all your letters, let's say all end of month invoices, letters and reminders, and within seconds, they're being processed. We've written a quite sophisticated address parsing in Matcher, where we uh, account for country-specific rules on each field, representations how names can differ in variations of writing, but also uh, spelling. Um, we then feed that whole thing into a very classic uh, data extraction to um, get due dates, bank details, or reference numbers to use that later on. Now, if we don't deliver the document digitally then, meaning the customer hasn't signed up yet, we have a dedicated output management system that allows for pre-processing and printing and packaging each letter at high speed. What that means is that instead of licking stamps and folding papers, for up to days at the end of each month. You upload it and you're done within seconds. And then we, <clears throat> sorry, and based on this uh, data that we extract, we build some strategic automation. Uh, automatic message and document filing, so if tax season comes, all your documents are already there, easy to find. We create proactive reminders that the invoices get paid in time, and we build crucial checks um, to decrease human error. That's very costly error. Think of sending the bank statement to the wrong party in a divorce case. That unleashes massive powers, right? So we can speed up these processes of up to 100 times. Think of, as I mentioned, onboarding in seconds instead of days. Or process cycles, you get paid in minutes instead of days. And that has a significant bottom line impact of up to 80% cost savings for these small to mid-sized businesses. But we don't want to stop there. We want to go beyond these high trust businesses and become the standard of customer company interactions. One conversation for everything you've ever exchanged. The potential is huge. So far, there are over 3 million SMEs only in our target group um, spending about 90 billion a year. Right now, we start small, focusing on about 1,600 companies in Zurich and London, mostly fiduciaries and lawyers. Now, the first paid customer is life. The next one we follow at the end of this month, and we have very active conversations with some of the other 1,598. Competition, as you see, they're mostly vertical competitions, so DocuSign very good at what they do. But TV is the only one-stop shop combining um, 
these functionalities specifically for SMEs. So you don't have a stripped down enterprise version paying still kind of SME uh, enterprise prices and enterprise complexity. It's all about simplicity of use. And the time is now, the, the SME market is still severely underserved. Our algorithm of not having to um, put up with ex very expensive integrations allows us to go after this market at scale. And GDPR is only one of the new regulations coming after them. And I strongly believe we have the right team for that. So Mira, our CTO, um, has specialized in NLP and machine learning over the last few years and PhD from the University of Sussex. I built e-banking systems and output management systems for banks across Europe. And uh, Cornell uh, built, from, sorry, built websites for the last eight years. We also attracted quite a few people uh, with amazing talent along the way. Output management specialists, software architects, bank CEOs, partners of uh, massive law firms, and growth hackers. Now, we are on our way to the next level. We already have a few soft commitments. We're currently raising 800K, and if uh, some people in here would love to pitch in, uh, we would love to have a talk after that. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, please come find me after the talk. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Probably have time for one question. Or not. Okay. Uh, thank you again, Philippe. And uh, see you again in an hour. An hour, yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, next up is a panel discussion um, on investment in AI. And for that panel, I'd like to invite up John Spindler, who's the CEO of Capital Enterprise. Um, John would be moderating the panel. So, yeah, let's uh, welcome John on stage. I'm already on stage, thank you. <laughs> okay, guys, I'm going to ask the panelists to come up and introduce them as they go. So we have Madeline here, Madeline Parra. Madeline is the founder, co-founder of an amazing business called Tweezoo, but uh, in the last year managed to sell out to, to um, kind of a fantastic UK business, a Skyscanner. Okay, then we have Thomas here, Thomas Stone, who's as well as basically being the co-founder of a company called Prediction.io, but sold of 18 months ago to Salesforce, is also a partner with myself in AI Seed. And we have Carlos here, Carlos Espinel from Seacamp, who is probably, along with his uh, business partner, Reshma, has probably invested in more seed stage business in Europe than anyone else I know of. And I've also had a fantastic year as well. And so some news. So what this is about is startup to exit for an AI business. So I'm going to get all the team to start off by just briefly, if I can, kind of uh, uh, basically giving us their story of how, what their, what their startup was, why they funded it, the challenges along the way, and how it all ended in a real kind of nice exit for them and their investors. So I'm going to start with uh, Marlene. Yeah, sure, thanks. Um, so yeah, so like John said, um, I was CEO and co-founder of a startup called Twizoo. Um, and we had started Twizoo mainly because we were really tired of sites like TripAdvisor or Yelp um, and uh, how kind of irrelevant or fake a lot of their reviews were. Um, so we had this idea that you could create a much more relevant product, but only based on what people were saying on social media. So we pulled all of our reviews automatically from Twitter and Instagram and had an app where users could search for things like um, sushi in London or cocktails in Brooklyn. And we would recommend based on just what people were saying on social media. Um, so we had done that uh, building a lot of machine learning models um, kind of before machine learning was cool um, <laughs> and those when apps were cool. Um, but it kind of turned out apps were really hard to get users. Um, so about three years into the journey, we pivoted to a B2B business where the underlying technology was the same, um, but we actually had a widget that we sold to customers like opentable.com or booking.com and agoda.com, and they could put this widget on their pages and still load their social media reviews. And it, it solved a real problem with them because they had realized how hard it is for them to get traditional reviews, to engage their audience. They were policing them all the time and um, it, it really helped them boost that conversion. Um, so luckily we did that pivot and, and things started going a lot better for us. We, um, while we were like struggling to get every single app download, we were quickly able to get over half a million um, daily unique users looking at our widget across the world, which was, which was a special moment. Um, and then um, we actually had pitched to Skyscanner as a customer um, 
And we we're like, hey, look at our cool widget. You can put this on your hotel pages or your PUI pages to inspire your travelers. And um, they, they loved it, so then they decided to uh, buy Twizoo, and that was the end of the, end of the journey for us. Um, but that's, that's that in a nutshell. Brilliant story, and I want to say about Marilyn, I've known her for a long time, and she was the single person that's made me make the worst investment decision I ever did, which was not to invest in Marilyn. <laughs> John had two chances to invest. Turned him down both times. Bad decision. There you are. <laughs> now we have another person that gave me an opportunity to invest. <laughs> Can it fire away, tell us the prediction IO story, Tom. John's anti portfolio. Um, <laughs> so it's great to be back at Pappy's. I gave a, a, a demo of prediction IO, I think, at one of the first or second um, Pappy's conferences in Barcelona. So, sort of up on stage, sweating, giving a live demo and coding on stage, which is uh, always a uh, scary experience. Um, but so, uh, my name is Thomas. I'm the founder of a company called Prediction IO, um, which actually started off life uh, similar to the story of Twizu under another guy. So, it's, it's actually called Tapping Stone. Um, always like and, that name. And <laughs> yeah, my founder convinced me that it was fate that Thomas Stone be the, the co-founder of Tapping Stone because he, he'd registered the domain. He's one of these guys that just sits on a bunch of domains waiting to build a startup. Um, but uh, so Simon and I met, we were in the computer science department at UCL and both of us had experienced the pain firsthand in previous um, startups of trying to build sort of these smart predictive features into a software. And we, and we knew the challenge that you'd have, especially building something on production and scaling it to a large number of users. Um, and what we felt at the time, so services like um, Twilio for voice and SMS or SendGrid for email um, had become very popular, these sort of developer APIs. And we felt you could build this for user behavior prediction. Um, so we felt you could build things like predictive um, recommendation for products or for uh, features like people you may know um, into web and mobile apps. Uh, so we built that out under Tapping Stone and what we learned very early on in the first six months is any large company, so I think we're talking to people like Channel 4 or even sort of small startups like this sounds amazing, we'd love to use this and we'd send them the developer docs and, um, and no one would upload any user data. It's like, hey, what's going on? You told us this was a great idea and you want to use our service. And what we found out is a lot of companies, they didn't want a dependency on a third party tool. They also were pretty skeptical about uploading all their user data, even if it was uh, anonymized and, and, and non-personally identifiable. So we, we sort of took a deep breath. Around the same time, um, we got rejected from YC, which was a big sort of king of the teeth. And uh, we, we decided to open source what we built to to date, um, which at the time wasn't much more than sort of a hosted uh, recommender system um, using like fairly basic uh, collaborative filtering. Um, and from that, we ended up getting a lot more adoption from large customers. So we ended up having a uh, Channel 4 customer, we ended up having uh, Fox for their video on demand service, Fox Play, uh, and crucially, Salesforce became a customer for um, a feature they're building for predictive lead scoring. Um, so long story short, the first commits, so the first time we released Prediction O was 2012. Um, and then over sort of a period of four years, we built up the developer community, had lots of active contributors, lots of people using and deploying Prediction O for various different use cases. Um, and we built up an enterprise edition, so another lesson learned the hard way in the world of open source is you can sort of you either make money from support and services or you can make money from charging for like a, an enterprise edition, sort of a premium version of the software. Um, so we did that a bit, bit late in the game. Um, and then and again, with, always with fundraising, sort of this uh, catch-22 of a lot of investors want to invest when, um, when you don't need the money. So even with our, our seed round of funding, um, we ended up closing a two and a half million dollar seed round in the States. And at that point, we moved the company to the US uh, based out of Palo Alto. Uh, we became one of the most popular um, uh, sort of open source projects for, for machine learning, sort of showcased by GitHub and had some of these large enterprise use cases. Um, and then around the time we were raising our Series A round in 2016, we pitched Salesforce Ventures and they came back to us with an interesting offer not to invest, but to, to buy the company. Uh, so we went back and forth um, had a few discussions internally, but managed to negotiate a really good deal where uh, Predictiono now continues 
under the Apache Software Foundation, so it's now uh, the community edition lives on in that respect. And then Prediction O's team and Enterprise Edition was then brought into what's now sort of under the umbrella of Salesforce Einstein and joined teams at Heroku and, and MetaMind. So uh, in, that was in 2016. Um, so yeah, that was the sort of uh, the short version of the story. And, and go back to manage, you had a kind of pivot into Enterprise as well. Kind of was that was that how did that come about and how did your come about with your pivot as well so uh, i think a lot of it was just sort of um getting getting feedback early on from customers so i think obviously uh, a lot of it was running into running into brick walls and uh, and and learning that we needed to try something different um so yeah there was a, f a fundamental uh, change in adoption from when it was open source and people could quickly build a proof concept and actually sort of kick the wheels and and see what be able to we built with Prediction O versus when we were trying to get them to adopt our service. But I think also in terms of timing, um, this was sort of in 2012 when I think Google had their Prediction API, but there was no sort of TensorFlow, there was no Microsoft Azure and Amazon Machine Learning Clouds. Um, so I think I think that that was an important factor too. Marlena, your your pill, what brought it on? Yeah. So. What brought it on? I mean, we, um, it was a tough one because we did have growth on the app, but it was an exponential, it was very linear. Um, and I kind of looked at our runway and I knew we had 12 months left. The math didn't work out uh, to get to like the million active users that I knew we needed to have. Um, and so my co-founder and I kind of, along the journey, companies had contacted us saying, hey, do you have an API or do you have a widget? We'd love to display these Instagrams or tweets on our pages. Um, but at the time we were, we were typical startup cocky because we considered all those companies competitors. So we're like, if um, you can get tweets and Instagrams on, say, OpenTable, why would you come use Twizoo? It, it didn't make sense. Um, so we were a bit desperate and we were like, well, let's just go back to these companies and ask, um, okay, well, if we did have an API, what would it look like? Um, why do you want it? We had never even asked that question before. And so once we had started asking those companies those, those questions, we had realized that's where the real problem we had solved lived. Um, so what we had really solved is we were the, really the only company in the world that could surface this type of information or these really great pieces of content from social media completely automated. Um, so we were like, okay, so let's double down on the focus of what we're good at, which is this technology, um, not necessarily the front end user experience, um, and, and see how much they would pay for it. And um, it was that kind of moment where we were like, what's the problem we've actually solved? Listen to our customers, which then were the B2B customers, and it all kind of then made sense. Um, but it took us a while to get there. I mean, it was, it was a slog um, in the app days for sure. Okay, I'm gonna introduce kind of Carlos now. I want Carlos to tell, a little bit about kind of Seacamp start, startup story and see if this pattern is similar to what you had. We also pivoted. Yes. <laughs> so I guess, I mean, do you want me just to give a little bit of brief of Seacamp and then, yeah. all right, so Seacamp started in 2007 and to date we've invested in over 270 companies. Uh, we have some brands that you might recognize like TransferWise, recently UiPath uh, raised some cash. And, you know, over those years, we've clearly seen a lot of companies of all sorts and, and, and sectors come and go. Some stick around longer, like fintech. And AI is one that we've been actively investing in. And in, in actually, I'm drafting a blog post to sort of showcase them as a group because we have, I think, now 20 AI companies that we've backed, which is probably one of the largest portfolios that's within a fund. It's just that it's not something we talk about. And I think maybe I, I won't go longer before we start doing maybe some, some discussion, but to, to cap it off, I think that the, the constraint that I have is that I will never, as a seed stage fund, be able to f identify companies that are infrastructure, AI infrastructure, as much as I will be able to identify commercial implementations of, of AI. So by, by that measure, if you look at our portfolio, it's largely uh, vertical or horizontal implementations of other people's AI technology. Okay. Um, well, let's come to that kind of discussion. I'm going to open up. Guys, I'm going to run around the room and get you to ask questions. And I'm going to pick on people because I know a lot of the room, if you don't ask a question, so do have them. Uh, but that issue, investing in an AI company or building an AI company, is it different from a, a standard software company? Tom. Uh, so... Uh, I think it's, uh, it's an interesting question. I think 
to the point that um, Carlos made, I think thinking of AI as a as a, a sector is um, not probably the way the sort of frame that I'd, I'd think about it. I think it would be more sort of it's it's sort of an enabling technology in the same way that sort of other shifts before, so something like mobile. Um, so I think that's one of the, the the incredible things is look at the sort of ubiquity and, and, and the, the, the potential application. So if I look at some of the companies that we've invested in the past 12 months um, for AI Seed, uh, some of which are, uh, will be speaking as, as part of Papage. You've got companies uh, like GTN that are working in, in drug discovery, uh, Asteroid are uh, building a, a simulation environment um, uh, for, for games and for, for augmented reality. Um, Anon.ai are, are working in the area of um, data anonymization. So you, during the, this is sort of, there are, there are companies that clearly are building these sort of enabling technologies that are sort of horizontal across sectors, but then you also have companies that are very vertically specific. But I think at a certain point, yes, all the criteria you'd look at any investment, so whether it's the sort of team, the technology, the total addressable market, uh, the defensibility, all of these factors come into play. Um, but I think there's definitely something with um, AI startups that because the level of technical expertise um, and potentially also the, the requirement of having access to potential priority data, um, that there are, there are other factors you might look at vis-a-vis -vis a, 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 a company building a, an app or a company building a, a completely different business. It's interesting, Nivota, because I know her quite well. She was building an app, but you're always a, your founding team was very technical. When did you discover you actually were a big data, machine learning, AI, whatever the buzzword is, company? Yeah, it's really funny because um, when we first went out pitching for our first round of investment, I had like three slides about this machine learning algorithm that we've developed and it's awesome and look at what it's doing. And um, I don't know if you were one of the advisors, but we had tons of people who I'd practiced the pitch on. They were like, take those slides out. Like nobody knows what machine learning is. Nobody cares. Apps you're doing an app, like put, put app in the slide. Um, so uh, in hindsight, I mean, I, we kind of always knew that, but we played it down um, because it wasn't the cool thing at the time. The cool thing at the time was apps. That, that was a mistake. And um, I think the same thing now for the machine learning, although it is like the cool, sexy thing now, um, at the end of the day, you would have to think about, like even if, if app is the cool thing or machine learning is the cool thing, but those are just enablers to whatever customer or user problem you're actually solving. Um, and that's it, right? So even the machine learning is kind of, uh, you know, it's made huge progress in the last five years in terms of the technology. It's still just an enabler. Um, so I would never brand my startup again as a platform or a technology or thing. It's always has to be about the end user, the end customer. Um, and I think that's one of the biggest learnings for us is that if we had stayed true to ourselves from the beginning, um, I think we could have saved a lot of the pain. I mean, it worked out in the end, but there was a lot of pain along the way. I'd blame those advisors. <laughs> no, it, it came down to me. I was like, yeah, it could be an app. An app's cool. Um, but yeah. And to Carlos, that kind of point, when you're assessing a machine and AI company, is there anything else beyond the standard things you do when you're assessing companies at the seed stage that you will do? Yeah. First of all, how many people are raising money right now, seed, seed stage money? Okay, well, my email's carlos at seedcamp.com. <laughs> Feel free to get in touch. Um, and he's recruiting at the moment. Yeah, so. Yeah, yeah no, I was sure more. Um, we can, we can co-invest. Um, so in terms of looking at, at deals, so I think one of the best pieces of advice that I got from an old friend was like, speak to your strengths, don't try to like be something you're not. And as investors, there's the, always the temptation of trying to be smart equivalent to a founder on any one thing on the premise that you're gonna add value. It ain't gonna work out, right? Like there's no way, there's no way you can, somebody, you know, like if you guys have been working on this straight out of, you know, a PhD, like what the hell am I gonna say? And so that by definition means that AI companies, when they're coming to present to you, are dealing with stuff that you will not comprehend. Like, it, it doesn't matter how much you try, you will comprehend it commercially, but not, the technology is always gonna be a bit challenging. And the speed at which technology moves means that the only way that you would fully get it is if you were a recent new partner. But then, if you're a founder pitching to a recent new partner, you probably, are la that partner is lacking experience of the venture world and commercial and, and agreement. So, the reason why I caveat that is because with AI and ML companies, if I don't have that 
then I, it's harder for me to evaluate the tech, but I can evaluate the commercial. And maybe that's where it's more of a humility check in saying, look, I can look for early commercial traction, which we said, if, you, if, you, if I know that you understand your customer, then I will take the leap of faith that you're being truthful when it comes to technology. It's not to say I'm not gonna give it a good go, but it means that I double down on that founder's understanding of the customer and go to market. And so if I had to say one of the patterns that I've noticed with recent AI companies that have come to talk to me is that it's technologists who are addressing an abstract problem rather than somebody who's in, in actual good contact and regular contact with a customer base that fully, um, that they fully understand what that pain point is and then build technology around it. And so I think all I'm doing is a, trying to cut which one of those two they are. Are they a technologist that have addressed the, an abstract problem for a customer that they kind of quasi understand? Or is it, or do I believe that they commercially understand that customer and I'm willing to give them a leap, a leap of, take a leap of faith on the technology? I mean, you probably did this a little bit. I remember seeing the team in what, 2015 with UiPath. Do you want to tell a little bit how you saw an example about UiPath at that stage? I remember at your demo day in 2015, yeah. meeting them, et cetera. And UiPath is a funny one. I actually, I, I can tell you a story of that one, but it's actually not as poignant as Fact Meta, uh, if you want okay, me to talk about that one. Um, <laughs> So I'll tell you both, but UiPath clearly is in the headlines, and that's why you know it's it's a good one to pick. But that one's an actually easy one to get because it, it, the robotic process automation, like it, you you know what people are doing, you know that this replaces a lot of that labor, and the product demo is pretty self-evident. So it either works or it doesn't. There's no like, there's no leap of faith there. Literally, it is like, oh, it worked. <laughs> like so, it was inevitable that it was going to be a big market as people transitioned from. So UiPath was actually an easy one, believe it or not. Factmata, which for those of you that don't know, is, is a, basically a company that's trying to assess what is fake news and sell that back into you know, social media um, uh, providers to figure out how to best curate whatever's being presented so people can still have access to it, but, but it's a little bit more skewed in the direction of fake or not, right? And, um, and that was more of a leap of faith because there's a lot of assumptions there, and you know, I'm, I'm not going to overshare it without asking the founder about what, what, what is it they're trying to do. But, but there is a huge leap of faith there on, the, on the, on the way that they were going to discern, fake or not, to create a data set, to train an algorithm, to then feed it back fully automated, and actually have a credible uh, fake news um, uh, deterrent. Like I don't even, like even today, I don't know how much that is something that's just gonna help curate, but not fully sort of deploy. And, and that's the leap of faith. Good investors with, with, alongside you there. Yeah. yeah. Some bits of... <laughs> Do you wanna say a little bit, and I'm gonna go to the audience about if and how you differ at AI Seed? Uh, Tom. Um, yeah, I don't wanna be the panelist that just agrees with everything Carlos says, but I think he made a very important point about that it's, it's it's the combination of those two things. You can't just have the extremely strong technical team that's uh, sort of uh, sort of in isolation solving uh, sort of abstract problems. I think the best teams that we see, um, whether this is in a single individual or it's uh, across the sort of co-founding team, have both the technical skill but also deep domain expertise. So they really understand the domain, they understand uh, the problem that they're solving in that particular industry, and therefore they, they have a really strong product vision of actually the, the problem they need to solve and the product they need to build that's gonna be something valuable and actually be able to build a large business around it. Um, so I think it, it's important that both of those, both of those things um, are, are true. Um, I think, um, I, I, th I think it's, uh, I think one of the things we probably do take a bit more of a sort of leap of faith on is, I guess, the, the stage at which we invest. Um, so I, I see the, the stage at which we're investing is more aligned with sort of angel investing, um, which unfortunately isn't as um, sort of prolific here as it is um, in the States. So a good example of this, Prediction O, we tried to raise a seed round um, within the first sort of year, uh, while we were still called Tapping Stone. Um, and I think we had an offer for 
something like 300, 400K, but it was for like 30% of the business, and we decided we'd be better off sort of bootstrapping it, living off our PhD stipends, rather than giving up for further company. Um, but then when we raised in, in the States, uh, and there's sort of, there's a hundred sort of seed funds or angel investors that you can go and go and pitch. And a lot of these people were, maybe they were sort of one of our investors, XG Ventures. Um, the guy was just the chief legal counsel at Google when it IPO'd. And it's sort of like, what do you do once uh, Google's IPO'd? You go and set up a seed fund. Um, so there's a lot more. And I, I'd love to see, I think, I think you could easily fund 10 times as many uh, startups here in, in, in Europe, and, and fine, lots of them are going to fail. I think the biggest factor in the company's success is how markets develop and timing, which isn't something that an investor can predict, uh, however smart they are. I think people can have good assumptions and they can look at the sort of evidence that they have in front of them of early traction, of the team's ability, of what they think the market's going to uh, evolve, but no one really knows how um, how companies or particular industries are going to adopt a new product or a new technology. Um, and the same in consumer as well. It's, it's very hard to predict. Okay, I'm going to leave it there because I want you lot to basically ask this great panel, kind of basically all kind of a, a founded organizations. Kind of, Carlos didn't say, but kind of Seacamp had a kind of exit. They sold a portfolio and they started a new fund this year. So uh, kind of it's in this kind of same area. Uh, for you to ask those questions. Not often do you have in front of you people who have been there and done it. So first question, Masood. I was wondering if you give some more insight into the process of pivoting. And so was the pivot predictable prior to actually going through the pain or did you have to go through the pain of realizing that your customers aren't buying or your product is kind of there and then if you change direction you can still make it success or was even the pivot an unknown? I, I, I think for, for me, if, if it was predictable, probably, hopefully, we would have uh, dreamed, we wouldn't have wasted our time or trying it. So I think very much the pain was a sort of a, a necessary uh, part, part of the process. It's an I, irony here being called prediction IO and not predicting the. <laughs> So uh, a co-founder from a previous start of mine, a guy called Rob Fitzpatrick, um, is author of a book called The Mum Test, and it sort of talks about how uh, customers will sort of lie to you. People don't want to say, like, your product sucks or, or we don't want to use it for X, Y, Z reasons. So a lot of the time people say, oh, that's really interesting or that's really cool. Um, yeah, let me check out the docs. And then they don't do anything about it. So I think we had to learn that the hard way by launching our service and trying to sell it to customers and not making any progress before we made the decision to change the strategy and actually start to make uh, progress with uh, larger enterprises. Yeah, I mean, I think for us, um, we, the pivot, what, we almost always had it in the back of our mind. So I always had kind of this looming date that was like, if we don't make this app a go, I know that we have some really good IP here. Um, so we might have to use it in a different way. Um, I don't know if that was just, if that, maybe is a bad thing to kind of have like a backup plan. Um, but I think we were so, we, we, we were committed to stay true to our vision, which was um, reviews are broken, right? Fake reviews are out there. They're not that relevant. You know, social media is where people are contributing this content. So I think for us, the pivot was not, I'd say predictable, but more comfortable because it wasn't like we were you know, taking a torch to everything we built and then like starting a whole nother idea and having to get our investors on board with that and all these things. It was always kind of like in the background as like, okay, if we can't get enough people to download our app, um, we have some IP here, let's reuse it somewhere else. But I don't think the exact um, execution of what that something else looked like, it wasn't predictable and it could have gone lots of different ways. Um, and we just, it was almost luck. She used to always kind of quote to me the, how many millions of lines of code she had in the product. Yeah, we liked it. We like our product. Biased, but yeah. Pivots. Your experience, Carlos. I, I was thinking through all the companies that we've had pivoted, and I don't think a single one of them would have known what would have been the most obvious pivot until after it had gone through that process. Yeah, not a single one. Next question. Come on, guys. Got a great opportunity here. Oh, good, great. Two down here, brilliant. One after each other. So you go first. What's your question, Say. Hi. Um, you mentioned about obviously investing in hopefully successful um, uh, startups. What makes um, an initial, initial pitch uh, attractive for you guys? Um, 
to, to make the leap into investing in, in, a, in a new startup. And for uh, Madalena, what was the best pitch that you did? So let's start with uh, Tom. Well, I'll start with Madalena. What was the best pitch you ever did? What did you learn by pitching? Probably not the pitch I did to you. <laughs> um, that was my fault, not yours. <laughs> yeah, the best, I mean, I think you get better at it over time. Um, once you understand what your most frequently asked questions are, get ahead of them work them into the pitch so they're not even answer, that you don't even have to ask them. Um, I think once you kind of learn that, where you know your gaps are, um, it makes the pitch a lot better because then the investors, I mean, you guys tell me, but then it seems like the investors have more appreciation that you've thought through it and it becomes more of a discussion than, well, have you thought about this or what about this or that kind of stuff and it kind of puts you on the more of the defensive instead of what it can be, like how big this can be, not, um, you know, have you thought about X. Carlos pitches do's and don'ts. So the, the, the top line word to use is congruency. Like what is, the, what is the congruency of all the parts that define a company? You know, everything from the team to the market to the product. Like do they all sing together? And if I use that as the, sort of the top line, then well, how do you discern that at the bottom line? And this is where it gets tricky. You can't, I haven't found that it works particularly well if you do it as a checklist. So like, if you added all the pieces up and they're all kind of like a seven out of 10, it doesn't ma magically become like as an aggregate seven out of 10. It actually be, can, can screw up everything. If I look at some of the companies that have succeeded. It's because they end up that way because something is amazingly good. So it means that, so you might have a 10 out of 10 in understanding the customer pain point, which means that it doesn't really matter whether or not what they've started off with is where they end up. It just means that they're constantly modifying their product to get to there. So the kinds of questions that I will see addressed in the pitch are things that showcase that strength, whatever that strength is. Whether it's, um, look, we're a bunch of really great people that have worked together for a long time. This is critical. The one, one correlation is the, the duration of the relationship is more important than the complementarity of that relationship. So as an example. Um, so I will be trying to figure that out if they're going to be addressing a sector that they don't know that well, but they have a really cool tech and they've worked together for a long time, that pitch will come together in a congruent fashion somehow versus, you know, a perfect pitch in many ways where you know, there's marginal comprehension of the mar limited customer development. The team kind of doesn't know each other that well. The product is still in a prototype stage. It looks good, but it's not fully deployed yet. So all those bits are like they cut you and then you bleed across all of them as opposed to just having one that's awesome. And then the rest of the presentation, I'm just kind of like, okay, well, I'll give them the leap of faith. Now, keep in mind, I'm investing so early that that's what I have to do. If I were like a Series A investor, then all that stuff needs to add up to something. Yeah, I guess from the sort of founder's perspective, I guess one of the, I guess one of the small benefits of like pitching probably hundreds of uh, sort of seed funds, VCs and angels like driving up and down Sand Hill Road or getting like stuck on the 101 um, was that we got a lot of practice at it. So practice makes perfect. So by the end of that, I think Simon and I had sort of a good double act. We sort of knew every question that was going to come up and had a very well rehearsed answer. Um, so whether or not that was a big factor in us uh, like closing our seed round or having offers for our, our Series A. Um, I think one of, one of the, the, the tricky things that now I see on the other side, so on the receiving end, um, seeing pitch decks is, I think a lot of people do, they're, they're sort of like, oh, what do I need to put in a pitch deck? And you, you Google it and you see like, oh, there's a Sequoia pitch deck example and it's, you sort of treat it like a checklist. So there are these sort of 12 slides that I need to make. Um, and not to say there's anything particularly wrong, there's nothing wrong with that. Sequoia are an amazing fund and have the returns to, to prove it. Um, but the problem with that is then it's very formulaic and you're not really, you're not getting across the sort of the story or the uniqueness of what you're doing and why you're doing it. It's more just like an exercise in, I'm transferring this information to you as an investor. Um, and the problem then is on the receiving side is it doesn't come across as sort of authentic. So the pitches that I love is where we've had like a demo video or like someone's just sent me a link, say, oh, download and try this out. Um, and Jareen, that's, that's a lot more engaging. And then from that, maybe I want to know more about the, the potential market or the competition. But I think starting off with something as simple as that um, is much better than like, oh, let's spend weeks polishing the perfect sort of MBA pitch deck. Okay, Ali, you had a question. Hi, so 
everything is being disrupted, so everybody's talking about disruption. What's going to disrupt VCs and uh, you know funds? So that's one. Secondly, I think you know, we are in a frictionless less economy. Everybody's talking about trustless world. So are we going to continue with this model? What's your Uber? What's your Google? What's your Facebook for uh, investors, the VCs? You know, what's what's the next thing which is going to disrupt this very industry? I'll take the first one. You take the second one. <laughs> I take the hard one, man. I'm going to land on a landmine here, <laughs> put myself out of a job. Um, unfortunately, this is the, the AI uh, conference, not the blockchain conference. <laughs> but you, you see where I'm going to go with this, I think. Oh, not ICO, please. No, I, I don't know if it's ICO. I think it's, the, there's, a, there's two angles, right? Like, there's the angle of decision making and then source of capital. So let's, let's break out your question into two parts, decision making and how do you get rid of a bunch of humans making mistakes? And then there's the other one, which is structure of capital and sources of capital, so that it's not centralized around all these pools of funds. Does that seem like a fair division of, of the two things? So the things that will likely generate change in the venture capital industry is how do you move towards successful data sets of correlations in early stage companies? I've looked at so many people attempting to do this, and the problem is that there's so many different parameters that in, in, in the presentation that before this one, the last one before this this panel, um, there is that, he said it was like 10% of the work was in determining how to put this in ML terms. Okay, I don't think anybody's ever cracked how to take venture investing and put it in ML terms. Yes, there is like this idea that you throw all these companies that have succeeded, but it you need to incorporate other things, like for example, the macroeconomic conditions of the company when it was invested in. And even little things like that can affect things quite a lot. And then you start going more and more macro, and then at one point you have too much data to actually have the right thing. So I'm not entirely sure how much more we have to wait until we have that sort of AI-driven investing to replace human beings at the center of funds. I don't know. And I don't know if we'll ever get there for various reasons. Then there's this, but there might be other things, like it might be anti-portfolios. You know, I could see where there would be VC funds that are AI-driven according to specific things. If they've been rejected, then invest. That, that kind of stuff I, I do see coming faster. Then to address the second one, so the reason why there's pools of capital that are raised partially has to do with the structure of how other funds that give them money have to do. So you're not only asking how do we disrupt venture is how do we disrupt pension funds? How do we disrupt all these things which are already aggregating? So can you do one without having to do all? I'm not really sure, but let's pretend that we could. Let's say we could literally like cut out, there was, it was straight people putting money into fun, VC funds, not people putting money into pension funds, pension funds breaking out. Let's just people straight into funds. Then I could start believing where you could have these decentralized funds and these decentralized funds, whether through a, a form of fund ICO or whatever, I, it's a separate conversation. But then there's a third part to it, which is how do you provide liquidity in private companies without decimating the, the motivations for the founders, which can vary if you have people now all being able to day trade decisions like yours. If I knew, if the board knew, or if I knew that you were about to do a pivot, perfect time to sell, right? Or perfect time to buy. And that just changes the dynamic for a company who's, you know, cash crunch or something. So that's my best attempt to answer the first one. <laughs> um, I, I was just going to say one more. I was going to say pre-series uh, coming up in this afternoon. But uh, no, um, I think... Well, tell us hmm. about pre-series. Why is AIC to kind of going to invest in a pre-series selected business? So uh, I think the, the key thing that I disagree with from, um, from Carlos's uh, response was that I, I think replacing the human, sort of replacing the investor is sort of not the goal. But if you ask me, is VC the only um, industry or to the extent you can call it an industry, um, sort of job that's not going to be affected um, by, by artificial intelligence, by the use of more data, making data-driven decisions, I think it would be crazy. And I think it would be sort of... Um, sort of almost sort of arrogant to suggest that that you can't use data to help you make better decisions um i definitely think there's definitely some real challenges if you take a like you can almost say it's analogous how um early stage venture capital uh, investing works now as the way that bank loans used to work so you'd sort of go see the bank manager and you'd sort of tell them a nice story about why you needed a need a loan and uh, and if he liked you then he maybe maybe approved your loan and look at your 
look at um, your sort of business plan. Uh, so it seems crazy to me that for sort of relatively small amounts of money, at this sort of seed stage investing, uh, that you still have to essentially go and do this sort of pitching. And, um, and there's, there's so much sort of bias and so much sort of inefficiency you're caught up in that process. But I've, I think the fact that uh, if you can make use of data to make those decisions, um, I think there's also some very, you talked about disruption, there's some very interesting stuff. So if you look at what social capital are doing, arguably things like Seedcamp or before them, uh, Y Combinator, or look at what sort of entrepreneur first. There's, there's lots of funds trying quite different models already. Um, I, I spent some time uh, working with Correlation Ventures, which are a fund based in San Diego, on their second fund now. And they, they don't get me wrong, the partners there are, are very smart people and just like any other partner in any other VC fund, they bring to bear their, um, their, their expertise and their, um, and, and, their, and their networks, but they also have a predictive model built on all the data going back to the sort of early 80s, like the inception of the venture capital industry, and therefore they can score every single investment opportunity and the co-investment syndicate in that round. Um, so I think this will happen more and more. Google Ventures don't like to talk very much um, and a few of the partners, I think, had uh, disagreements with the way that they make their investment decisions and, and had to leave. Um, but there's, there's lots of big American funds uh, doing this, leveraging this. Okay, Madalena, two things that you would do to disrupt the investment uh, kind of space. Two things. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I think that, I actually, I do think ML will come into play in seed stage investing and even more so in later stage investing just because we either have to accept that investing is completely random and therefore there are no patterns or there are patterns that a machine can learn. Um, so um, I think, I don't know, I, I don't think that all investing will be replaced by a machine, but I think that over the next, say, 10 years, um, I think VC investing will look very different at the various stages than they do now. That's just my, that's my personal opinion. Um, the second thing, I mean, I think uh, there's something, so I, I'm interested in the, how like the Kickstarter model, model was cool and then like suddenly was not cool. Um, I think there's something there, um, but they didn't get it right the first time around. Um, I don't know what the answer is, but I think democratizing um, investments uh, for the general public uh, will take some shape or form. I don't think we've seen the right form yet, but I think we will at some point. Okay, I'm going to go to the final question because I, I think we have to move on. Louis not waving at me, so I think. Um, obviously, obviously, the final question is you're, you're in an audience of basically people, developers, experts, startups in the kind of AI machine and in space. What would you tell them now? You've kind of gone through this kind of uh, the, the journey. What would be the one thing that you would want to say to your younger self that you want to say to these guys now? Um, I think I would tell myself to, to be patient. Um, the startup journey is absolutely insane, and it will, it will challenge yourself, especially if you're doing it right and you're putting everything into it. Um, you'll learn so much about yourself and your, your co-founders and the team that you're working with. I think for me, whether it's machine learning or any startup, um, just be patient if you and, and pick something you truly believe in. Right? Don't just start a startup because you don't like your job or um, you think it's a cool thing to do. Like, make sure what you are starting you truly, truly believe in and then stay patient. Um, By the way, she didn't like her job and she did think it was cool. It is true, I didn't like my job. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, I, I did believe what we were doing and I think um, seeing a lot of startups that started around the same time as us and as you guys know, the London startup scene is small. Um, I think the people who really pursue and, and, and push through are the ones who really believe in what they're doing and really look at yourself in the mirror and make sure that that is you. Um, and I think if you can do that, it, it, will, it will work out in your favor. Good advice. Tom, anything? Uh, I, I, think to, I think to add to that, I think um, I think every startup, whatever, whatever sort of, I think one of the challenges, like uh, sort of what gets reported in the general media. So, Jareen, what you read in TechCrunch is not what running a startup is like. You, there's only two articles we ever got written in TechCrunch about prediction. One was we raised a seed round of two and a half million dollars, and the second was we got bought by Salesforce. Um, like four, four years later. Uh, so 
Do you mean that's not the reality of running a startup? Like the stuff you do day in, day out is like boring, laborious, sort of hard work that you have to do and it sort of compounds over time. But a lot of things like responding to user support forums or like writing code or going to do sales or, or pitching for an investor or do you mean all this sort of stuff um, and like working long hours, hiring teams. Uh, but I think also the importance, uh, to Madeline's point, of being persistent and being resilient. So. We got rejected multiple times, so not just from Y Combinator, even from um, our, our university, uh, so UCL, uh, where we sort of hosted today, um, had a sort of business plan pitch competition where they give out sort of 50K a year uh, to sort of promising ideas. And we even pitched for that um, and, and weren't given any money. So <laughs> I think there's a, if you, if you really believe in the sort of uh, the vision or, or what you're building as a company, you'll persist through those challenges. And, and every startup journey has massive ups and downs, whether it's a, uh, whether it's a success or a, a failure. Final words to you, Carlos. So one of the biggest correlations I've seen with successful companies is, is the depth of, and the breadth of relationships. And the temptation is to put your head down and, and build, 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 and not necessarily build relationships with with either customers or with investors or with people who can then lead to uh, introducing into prospective hires which will be critical in developing your tech so i think that probably the biggest thing that you have especially as a founder to do is is focus on what kind of relationships you want to build and start building them early before it's too late Brilliant. can i t really big round of applause so great panel thank you so much Okay, we now have a presentation on kind of AI from an investor's perspective from my good friend Chris there from Forward Partners. Do you want to come up, Chris? Okay, two seconds. <laughs> Lots of friends in the audience. I, well, in those two seconds, I'll tell you a little bit about myself and Capital Enterprise. One of the things that reason why we're co-organizing this today is that we're running a program with uh, the Digital Catapult, Alan Turing Institute, and Bart's Health. And one of the things that we're doing is funding placements of PhD staff to work in AI startups to on research projects for a period of between six months and two years. If you are an AI startup, if you want have people in your own academic experience who want to work in your organization, or if you don't know them and you want us to find them, come and see us. We will, uh, we're looking to do that for about 25 uh, startups in the next year. So we are co-funding 40% of that salary, finding them, basically linking to your own private cloud machine learning kind of garage run by Digital Catapult. And we're also funding six fellowships to work at Bart's Health Trust. So any startup can get access to Bart's amazing largest data sets in basic population health in the world to build out a startup. So that's the Cap AI program. There's my little plug. And now we've got Chris for Forward Partners. Thank you, John. John that's, a, that's a very uh, smooth transition there on my side. So. Um, just a quick show of hands, uh, so I get a sense of the room. How many people here have heard of Ford Partners before? So, is a, okay, brilliant. So, for those that haven't heard about us, um, we are, I'm sure, uh, Carlos at Seed Camp and maybe Thomas from AI Seed Fund might want to contest us on this, but we are officially the world's earliest stage VC fund. So, we invest quite literally off the back of an idea. So, provided that the founder is very credible, maybe if it's an AI startup, they're technically brilliant, or if it's a market pull um, startup, they are, so have deep domain expertise. We invest uh, £300,000 plus operational support. So it's a sort of a uh, game-changing combination of not just cash, but also um, you know, execution. And that comes in the form of about 15 uh, scale-up team in miniature, 15 people covering full-stack development, UX design, growth, talent, um, maybe the full spectrum of activities that a startup has to endure in that sort of exciting nightmare of uh, starting up. And um, so uh, we also invest at Seed, uh, up to a million. And um, in terms of sector focus, uh, traditionally, you'll probably notice from our websites and our uh, portfolio from our first fund, um, we uh, have focused a lot on next generation, well, e-commerce and marketplaces. 
as well as some SaaS as well in Fund 1. Fund 2, we've, uh, we've uh, transitioned. Um, I can talk a little bit about the motivations behind that. It's kind of the main focus of this talk. Um, uh, we've transitioned into what we call applied artificial intelligence. And um, the main sort of driver for that is we, we did a sort of, we looked back at our first fund. Um, so we invested in about 37 companies. These are just uh, the, the investments we made at Precede. So maybe some ones you might recognize from companies like Appear here. Um, also Patch recently uh, raised their sort of late seed round as well as a few others that you might notice. Um, we sort of took a look at our portfolio and thought, which ones are the sort of top performers here? Which ones have really moved the needle and grown faster than their peer competitors? And uh, uh, probably unsurprisingly, all the ones that really did had some kind of, um, sort of data-driven component to the business model or the way they're attacking a given market. And um, so uh, we went through a sort of long process. And um, in fact, I think there's a couple of people in this room that helped us with it um, uh, around you know, the, the next sort of next big thing. So what, what would we look at? And um, I just want to caveat this before just taking an article I read recently. I didn't, did anyone else read this article in The Edge? Really, really good piece. And um, someone I, I, in a career I've, looked, I've sort of followed for a long time, a chap called Kai Fu Lee, um, who is a sort of uh, machine learning researcher who's worked in sort of every single sort of big tech company you can imagine on these sort of machine learning projects. Uh, turned VC, so he's, he's since set up his probably, I think, the leading ch uh, VC fund in China. Uh, and uh, he really captured that kind of the spirit of the age in terms of where we're at, and also uh, in sort of a few sentences validated our own investment thesis, which is quite um, sort of uh, nice from our perspective. But I just, I just like some of these, um, these, these uh, quotes. So, you know, this idea of low hanging fruit, and, um, you know, that our whole perspective was that you don't need a PhD to build an AI startup. Um, in fact, you don't necessarily need um, to build a, a startup where artificial intelligence and mach machine learning are the core economic sources of value for that business. Um, in fact, let me just take this off. Um, what, what this has developed into is a bit of a narrative in the venture capital scene, at least um, amongst earlier stage investors, that we're seeing a, a, effectively a third wave of um, startups. So what we originally started as um, various other waves that sort of happened before this that I think um, that this article I mentioned before really captures. So right, right, right away from the 50s through the 70s, 80s, and 90s, and really actually artificial intelligence coming into sort of fruition in terms of what that actually means. Uh, we, we also saw a more recent sort of structured series of waves where we initially from research-led organizations. So this is, I actually borrowed this from a, a friend of ours at uh, Point Nine Cap, but I really like the way this captures some of the, um, the movements we're seeing in, in sort of machine learning uh, startups. So it starts off with research-driven companies, or probably potentially um, acquired sort of before their time, um, but really effectively set up as acquihires by large corporate tech companies that wanted to bring in that talent into the organization and build that onto their own platforms and their own infrastructure so they could um, you know, help an entire ecosystem to flourish by building on top of Google APIs, Microsoft Azure, TensorFlow, you know, all these fantastic off-the-shelf libraries and, and um, uh, sort of software that we, we're now seeing a whole host of startups building on top of. Uh, and this is where kind of applied AI comes in. And the reason why I sort of, you know, when I, when I first joined VC about a year, just under a year ago, I, I actually pitched my business to Ford Partners. Um, and it was it's the first time I'd, I'd been accused of this saying, well, I, I, I sat opposite and the investor said, yeah, it's an interesting, you know, you've got a few clients and you're obviously doing some good work for them, but it's very kind of core AI. And I was like, well, what on earth does that mean? <laughs> you know, I, so I, I suddenly saw this kind of term being bounded around about like, you know, core, core AI, machine learning as a service, and you know, AI infrastructure. And I say, well, yeah, I mean, it's the technology is there for the taking. We want to apply it to this given vertical. And uh, what, it see, what, what seemed is it just wasn't enough. I mean, you're effectively competing against some very well-funded uh, tech companies, uh, and this is increasingly becoming commoditized for the benefit of a lot of other, of, of other people. So this kind of applied AI wave kind of came in, and uh, that's when uh, you know, we started to think, right, what is applied AI, and what, what do we want this to be, and uh, what, what's our sort of investment hypothesis? Um, and it was kind of like the first step in developing what we uh, eventually call, sort of calling an applied AI playbook. So um, lots and lots of questions, not least from our LPs, um, so our limited partners who invest in our fund. And um, we started to, you know, the main ones we wanted to kind of question was what are the techniques that are sort of readily available you know, that can enable um, a, a new wave of startups. 
Uh, what use cases can these techniques really actually add value to? So where's their sort of meaningful impact on the, on the end product? Uh, and then finally, are there yeah, enough use cases where this aspect of intelligence can actually um, you know, allow you to build a phenomenal business and a great product? Um, so in terms of the steps that we took, um, and I'll show you sort of exactly what this actually looks like. Uh, we created a long list of sort of AI techniques, uh, sort of everything from just simple regression to optimization models, um, you know, decision, decision trees, random forests, everything we could possibly think of. And again, as I mentioned, there's a few people I noticed on, in the conference who actually was, were in the meeting, w meetings with us at the time who really helped us flesh out what those techniques were. Um, and then set them against a set of, in fact, it's probably easier if I show you. So we set them a set of, uh, against a set of um, uh, effectively capabilities. So what would that allow that organization, that startup to do uh, as part of the, the way they were kind of formulating their business model or their business case? Um, we then listed a, a sort of a number of different use cases. So where could we actually see this um, capability really adding a lot of value? So is it in customer service interactions? Is it in the plethora of medical data records that large hospitals are struggling to sort of make sense of? Is it in legal services? The list was sort of fairly limitless, um, but we started to, from that list, we started to build up a set of hypotheses of companies. So conceptual startups. This, remember, this was a year ago, and you already started to see some of these at the time. So uh, you can read some of them here, like a personalized learning platform or a, a subs uh, subscription commerce. So we already had a company in the, in the portfolio called Thread that kind of fits that model. And then um, financial services brokering. So we're already seeing companies like Well Simple and et cetera. You know, lo lots of different, um, quite sort of simple concepts that we, we envisaged that we would start to see more of. And lo and behold, um, we did. You know, we actually, so a year later, we've had about 490 recorded interactions with what we would classify as an applied AI founder. Um, we spent a good deal of those meetings really understanding the tech stack, really trying to get below the surface if there's actually some capabilities within the team or in the founder themselves and they can deliver on the promise of what they're doing. Um, and then this kind of came up with this concept. So just generally, I really don't like the Gartner hype cycle, but um, you know, this is, is a sort of framework that helps a lot of people understand different, uh, different techniques that are readily out there now. And uh, we effectively set them against, against that, uh, that cycle. And it effectively um, allowed us to kind of, you know, year looking back at 490 different um, interactions, we started to think, right, what have we seen? Um, you know, what's our hypothesis for the future? So if we were to, you know, we've invested in 10 companies now out of Fund 2. Um, and they kind of cover an entire, like, mostly a B2B, but they do cover a huge sort of spectrum of um, different applications for artificial intelligence. And um, we started to look, look back at some of the more promising ones and, think, and set them on a timeline. So it, we're, we're, a lot of VCs work to effectively five-year timelines. Um, any longer than that, there's, there's maybe some more patient capital available, but um, deep tech takes sort of deep pockets and very long commercial timelines, and unfortunately that's not a luxury we have with our own LPs. So we're picking, you know, we like to pride ourselves on picking markets very early on, uh, and ones that, and hopefully winners that will effectively attack a given market, and their solution, product, or service, whatever it might be, will become effectively implicit. It will become a dominant design in the space they're going after. So um, we listed a few examples. So this could be a horizontal or a vertical. And the, the idea is that over a five-year period, they'll go from being emergent to ubiquitous and therefore, in, and then later implicit in a, in a given vertical or horizontal. Um, I thought what might help just a quick five minutes just to kind of actually wrap this up and kind of actually make it make, have it make sense in people's minds was actually um, just take, say, four of them and sort of discuss a little bit. So, um, you know, I think I have, over the course of the year, have increasingly held this view that AI chatbots are a little bit faddish in nature. You know, you see sort of there's a spectrum of those which are really just, you know, are using off-the-shelf NLP engines or even, you know, maybe frameworks or just development platforms uh, right down to the very sim simple layer of something like chat fuel. And um, it's certainly providing a, an entirely new channel for a lot of startups to sell their goods or um, improving their customer service interactions uh, to the extent where we've actually built one ourselves for founders because we notice we get, you know, we kind of treat our own business. We're talking about how VCs are disrupting the VC model. We kind of treat our own fund as a platform, as a sort of e-commerce business or mar online marketplace business. Um, and we realized that um, first we've got GDPR kicking in in a, in a few months' time and we'll have to ask our 20,000 email subscribers to you know, resubscribe. Um, and it's also that um, the click-through rate was appalling. So we just thought, well, what could we do to improve that? 
we're getting a 70% click-through rate on our bot. It was recommending, um, you could ask it a question, it would recommend content based on uh, you know, the keywords. It's a very unsophisticated engine, just to, just to, like, just to lay claims to the faddish nature of chatbots. Um, it's not particularly sophisticated. Um, but you know, it kind of was sort of laying the point out there that you know, if, if, if companies that are building an entire business, like an estate agent or a, uh, you know, a wealth management business, on, on yeah, well, that's it. You know, so we, we're looking for something a little bit more under the hood. You know, I think, and that's something we, we were increasingly sort of giving feedback to the to those founders. When you have a technically brilliant founder in the team, it's immediately what they bring. But then you need that kind of domain expertise. I wasn't thinking about investment. I'm just thinking about your website. Oh yeah, yeah, <laughs> definitely. Yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll definitely uh, tender out on that one. <laughs> so um, yeah, so we, you know, I think. There's an assumption here that this is as a micro trend, and I sort of laid it out here that these will become complete implicit in all customer service interactions within the next five years. Probably 90% of the top of the funnel will be dealt with in an automated fashion using NLP. Um, SaaS, yeah. So there's a bit of a sort of existential crisis going on along um, within a lot of um, SaaS investors at the moment, where everyone's sort of asking what next for SaaS. And th this image is from a conference, a Salesforce conference, I think roughly about 10 years ago now. Where they, you know, they were um, heralding the end of software, you know, and the, and the the, the oncoming sort of um, slaughter that SaaS would bring to software startups. Um, and now, actually, um, investors are asking, what next for SaaS? And uh, this is something that we've seen ourselves with our most recent investments, um, where you're actually seeing SaaS becoming even cheaper, even faster, even better as a result of artificial intelligence. And um, a recent investment we made is in a sort of quality assurance uh, testing, so software testing, um, ironically, uh, where instead of using script-based methods to try to solve 20% of the problem, um, and there's a lot of different solutions out there, it's a very competitive market, this company's differentiated itself a little bit like UiPath by using mach machine-based um, models to detect faults in scripts and actually um, fix the problem. Um, going back to as it, the fact that it knows what good looks like, it can actually um, you know, re um, repair the, the fault. Um, the third one, which is actually part of our, still part of our investment thesis, is around e-commerce. Um, however, generally e-commerce and marketplace, there's a lot of, there's very few opportunities left now. Um, ones that haven't either been killed by Amazon or already have a sort of dominant player in the space. And those that are left, um, you really have to think very cleverly about how are you going to differentiate your business from being a gener another generic digital solution to being something a little bit different. And in the case of a company like Thread, you know, this is actually very, very simple. This is not, nothing, to, you know, in terms of the, the kind of concepts, and this is quite an old one now, it's taking very active data inputs from a customer. You fill out a survey, you set a set of, set of preferences, and you uh, and, and, uh, um, can therefore build a better recommendations engine when it comes to uh, you know, giving you a sort of selection of clothing from their product list to, um, you know, to buy. But it does mean you get great retention and you get great conversion and ultimately marks thread out from a lot of other competitors who really struggle in, with those specific metrics. Um, another one which speaks more to my own background um, where you see it more on the operational sort of back end of the business uh, is a company like Swoon Editions. So it's a probably not a very well known fact that actually Swoon is um, more of a tech company that happens to sell furniture. So I think when I was there it was a good 50 people and 25 of them were techies and uh, uh, sort of analysts as well. And um, really, the, the whole model there was around zero stock, zero lead time, using optimization models to predict what you might sell in the future. If anyone's interested in talking about that, that started off just using an Excel solver function and then slowly moved into Jupyter notebooks and automation once we've got the database sorted. But you know, this is just how simple um, a business can, can start from a cold start. You don't have to have all these sort of pre-built proprietary algorithms built in on, the day, on day one. And then a final one, which is a personal favourite of mine, because you know, recently sort of looked at this investment and actually have will announce a deal shortly, was a um, childcare marketplace, and um, uh, not selling children, uh, but uh, is actually um, at effectively a um, after-school uh, day uh, kid kids care market. So you can um, match with nannies who can look after the kids after school. Uh, and um, what, I, what I wanted to make is sort of clear here: there's a company. It was in this space also where, and I called them out in a blog post, and they've since, I think they've since changed their, their landing page. Um, but, you know, I, I'm actually, it's a bit unfair because I haven't met these guys, but um, I think their, their, their landing page was talking about AI applied to childcare. And I just thought, well, mums and dads don't care about AI and, you know, how that's going to help them with their nanny 
sort of duties you know, after school. Um, and uh, you know, the kind of point I was trying to make here is that you know, there's a company that does use really clever you know, matching algorithms, you know, personality profiling for the nannies and the kids, and therefore they get a great match rate and save money on acquisition costs. Um, but they also have you know, supply and demand matching, which is very difficult to do, and it's a real-time way, and they, they do all of these things. And, um, but as, as, as aside from just doing some clever stuff in the back end, they've got fantastic execution, and they still understand the market, and they've got deep domain expertise in the team. So you can never have a supplement one for the other. So just something to bear in mind when you're forming teams, if, if they're um, founders out there who are sort of building their founding team. But um, I hope that gives a bit of a taster. We're, we're sort of, it's very much a work in progress, and it, it changes every time we, we meet a, a new founder, we make an, a new investment, and we see it through. And there's still a lot of unanswered questions in that first slide I, I had initially. Um, but I'd love to kind of you know, crowdsource some thoughts, and um, certainly if there's any founders in the room who fit that um, category of applied AI, it'd be great to, um, to catch up afterwards. Okay, I think we've got one question, time for one question. Yeah. Ali, it's you again. <laughs> I'll ask an interesting one. So uh, applied AI, how is different from what you guys have always done with apps and e-commerce model? Yeah. Because the barrier to entry is, uh, again, very low. You know, anybody can put up, uh, put together these APIs and mm -hmm. start matching and doing things which all belong to applied AI. So how are you going to counter that thing? Yeah, so that, that's a wonderful point, and it really um, strikes at the heart of, our, of where we add value. Uh, so the whole th investment thesis for Fund 1, and this was back in 2011, 2012, was that barriers to entry for e-commerce, marketplace, applications, web, you know, websites effectively, uh, are very low. And what really makes a company stand out is their ability to execute at speed uh, and with you know, real precision and expertise about understanding the market they're going after. So we're really backing the market, um, not necessarily the tech. The tech is an enabler. I think a lot of VCs, I don't know if this is, and a lot of VCs have got done very well um, through this, but it's, um, it's it becoming increasingly hard to, to uh, develop effectively venture scale outcomes by investing in what we would call core AI simply because they get acquired too early or large tech giants have effectively commoditized the market before you really get to set off and um, so yeah it really speaks to our own model of getting them to a great seed round hitting the market at speed and with good execution. Okay well thank you so much for a good round of applause for Chris. So, guys, we've got a treat now. We've got basically kind of Dimitri and Libby is going to come up and give us a massive overview of what's going on in the AI startup space in Europe. That's all you're doing, just kind of like kind of uh, insight, analysis, and overview. Uh, by the way, just to kind of put it in context about my, me passing on Tweezu, I've had a little email from Nico from Revolut and from Rob from, Di from Basic Magic Pony, who I also passed on, saying basically, what about us? So uh, I have a track record. No. So Europe European machine intelligence. We're landscape. just having some slight technical issues. I don't think I'm connected. Hold on, everyone. Well, first, first I should say, so uh, my name's Libby. Please do, yeah. yes. Yeah, I think it's just connecting to the internet. Um, my co-presenter, Dimitri, and I uh, want to talk about mapping the machine intelligence landscape in Europe, um, uh, hopefully with your help. If we go back into it, that should be fine. Gone. <laughs> Still trying to connect. And uh, that's my lovely wedding in the background. Oh, congratulations. <laughs> it's a while ago now. We're going to do it like this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> See what's See? coming. <laughs> So first, actually, I'm just going to take a moment to do an infomercial, and I have permission to do this, from Tom at least. Um, Machine, in Gar Machine Intelligence Garage is a digital catapult initiative backed by CAP AI to provide startups with access to um, computational resources so that they can get to market or get investment faster by achieving minimum viable products. And we, Digital Catapult has partnered with a number of 
um, organisations to help provide that computational resource. So um, AWS and Google Cloud are providing credits. Uh, the Catapult itself has got um, some uh, DJX1 boxes um, and we're working with uh, newer entrants like Graphical as well. Uh, so I just wanted to make the startups in the audience aware of this initiative. It's completely free to start up. There's a rolling six-week application process. You don't need to give any equity away. It's very light touch. So if you're interested, then do come and talk to me or Anat over there afterwards, or just click on the link. Um, and we hope to hear from you. So in the beginning, 2014, there was this machine intelligence landscape which was put together by a lady called Siobhan Zillis, who's an investor at Bloomberg Beta in America. And um, we thought this was really great, and it was one of the first attempts to try and understand what the applied machine intelligence landscape looked like, what people were actually building using a lot of the exciting research. Um, and it kind of was an attempt to inform, structure, and promote some of the mainly startups in the landscape. But there was sort of one thing wrong with it, we thought. Uh, this is me and my um, co-founders at Project Juno, Sebastian and Law. It was, it was very North America focused, and we thought there was quite a lot going on in Europe that could benefit from being highlighted. So we put together this landscape, this taxonomy, way back in 2016, which seems like a really long time ago now. Um, and it was, it was useful, but... This is one of my favourite quotes. So, all models are wrong, but some are useful. This, this landscape was wrong. If any of you have ever tried to categorise or do a taxonomy for anything, it's, it's always an oversimplification. And there will be some startups that didn't fit into any of the categories that we put together, or that pivoted and so changed, or that fit in many. And we essentially had made the decision of where to categorise them ourselves without their input. Of course, it missed startups out as well. Uh, but it was useful, so we were contacted by investors, by startups, by event managers, um, journalists, uh, public policy makers who were all looking to understand the landscape in more detail um, and find startups to invest in or talk to or come and talk at their events. Uh, but things have got even more busy. So this is Siobhan's third landscape, and actually that is now a couple of years old as well. And I suspect, although I don't know, that the reason she hasn't produced an update to it is that trying to get all of the information about landscape on a single page now is, is an impossible task. Um, so we, we find ourselves in a situation where we need to find the signal in the noise. And there is such a lot of information that the requirement to be informed, to have a framework to talk about machine intelligence in Europe, and to promote what's going on here uh, is ever greater. So, we need to solve some problems, and for that, Dimitri. Yep. And so, uh, we've decided to kind of launch a community project with the help of Project Juno, AIC, and at the moment myself, and we would like to kind of invite all of you to visit this bit.ly link where essentially we're uh, recreating the project, using um, Project Juno's taxonomy of uh, AI startups, we're recreating an interactive version of the, m of the landscape in Europe of AI machine learning startups. So if you, if you go, so, yeah, so, so the current prototype of this map should be live on that bit.ly link. And, uh, Hopefully the internet is working. Sure, check. Yeah, I mean it says online. Uh, go on, you go on, you serve guests, get off and you serve guests. Go on to... Oh, um, that's what the problem Go was. to L39 Visitor. Never use UCL's internet first. <laughs> yeah, so there we are. So essentially we're following, we're using the same taxonomy that Project Juno used for the previous versions. And I would just like to do a little demo. And so essentially we're breaking down the, the eight startups that we've identified so far. And we actually are uh, inviting anyone who, is, who wants to contribute to just kind of visit the website. And you can easily just uh, submit, uh, access a Google form where you can submit all the information that we kind of require. Um, yeah, and so the ultimate goal is kind of to 
bring transparency to the market and kind of allow people, allow startups to kind of display themselves in one place on the internet, allow investors to kind of display their portfolio companies and anyone who's interested in uh, AI, AI startups to kind of find everything in one area. And say, for example, we wanted to, I wanted to demonstrate Data IQ, who are one of the sponsors. And so right now you can kind of get the basic information, Data IQ, and kind of what stage they're at. And obviously, as time progresses, we'll be able to add more and more information. So for example, if you're a startup, you'll be able to kind of display information on if you're hiring, or if you're a member of certain, say, accelerator, or uh, who's your invest, who are your investors, for example. Uh, OK, I start, start dialing in now. No, Alex at Selden's yeah. already doing it, so. And then kind of. Oh, and then ultimately, as we get more information, we'll also be implementing basic analytics. So for example, here we'll kind of give you a little breakdown of, of where the funding is going to the startups, for example, uh, and also what kind of industries, based on the taxonomy we have, what kind of industries are getting the most funding. And so obviously, the more, inf the more data we have over time, the more interesting and exciting these data visual visualizations will become. Um, yeah. And that's kind of it for me. So the Bitly link is there. Yeah. So yeah, and if you want to kind of get involved, there are contact details available here as well. Um, and so yeah, as I've said, <coughs> we believe that using this map can kind of contribute to different members of the community. And we, you know, with your help, it can be a real help to everyone. Louis, will you send the links out to everyone? Yeah. Yes. Do you want to finish? No, that's okay. Yeah, that's it really. Any questions? Any questions for Libby or Dimitri about the landscape at the moment in Europe? Um, well, the simplest question would be, how does it compare to the North America side, state side? And I guess second part is, um, do you have any demographic for the rest of the world, i.e. Asia or Middle East? Um, Part of the reason that I don't know the answer to that is that we don't have an updated European machine intelligence landscape. Um, certainly in 2016 there were far fewer startups and there were some differences in emphasis in where the startups in Europe were working. So for instance autonomous vehicles was very big and may have reflected perhaps some of the automotive focus of Europe, in particular Germany. Um, so, but, I, but I don't know, and, and that's one of the things that's become most apparent over the last two years. A lot of people have contacted us asking to slice the data in different ways, find out funding by region or location, number of startups, um, and a static landscape simply can't give that information. So, um, and, the, and lastly, I, I simply don't have enough connectivity in the rest of the world to, to know. Okay, any other questions? Or we can, oh yes, great, one more. So how do you create the, the data that you receive? Uh, or originally, the um, Project Juno landscape was based on a WIP list that I kept of all the startups that I came across and met. And we had about 400 startups at that time. Uh, that is not a very data-driven, useful way of doing things. So right now, we will pre-populate this uh, dynamic landscape with uh, data that is open from Project Juno, from AI seed. Um, and I, I would think that we're at about 800? Yeah, I mean, we have data on 800, but right now uh, around 200 startups are listed on the website already. Yeah. Okay. Right, so round of applause. And this is a very worthy thing, so please do participate. <laughs> okay, then. So I think we're coming to the moment of you've all been waiting for, which is the pitch. Is that right, Louis? A battle, kind of like. Um, so let's get Louis to come up. He's going to compare the battle. I'm going to explain you basically how that's going to work and the prize. I'm not explaining the prize. You are, no? Yeah, you're giving the prize. So. <laughs> it's a big prize. Um, so we've done this uh, startup battle a few times already. And um, I think this is the fourth time it's being done that per piece. Uh, but anyways, this the prize, as you were saying, is the biggest we've ever had, so we're very excited about that. Um, I'm not going to say much, actually. I'm just uh, waiting for Arturo to get set up. 
Arturo is the CEO of Pre-Series, which is the uh, company that developed the AI behind this uh, AI Someone jury me. thing. What's, what's going on? I, I can use, this, I can use the, uh, the keyboard. Yeah, is that yeah. fine? Um, so yeah, the, the, the jury, it's a, it's a startup competition that's kind of different from the other ones that you've probably seen uh, because the, the jury is an AI, um, which is going to materialize itself on stage soon. But <laughs> all right, um, I'm going to stop talking. I'll hand over to Arturo. And uh, yeah, let's uh, welcome Arturo on stage. Thank you, Louis. Thank you for having us. Uh, it's always really nice to be uh, at Papi's and, 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 run, and run the show. So <clears throat> um, we had a very interesting conversation uh, before with the, um, with the uh, panel on uh, investing in AI. But uh, our view on, on the venture community is that uh, it's still a very relationship-driven, uh, personal face-to-face. -face. That's the way business is still done in the, in the venture community. Uh, over time, we've seen investors that you know adopted uh, some sort of um, data processing through most of the time Excel sheets where investors uh, collect some sort of KPIs, what's your CAC, what's your uh, uh, click per thousand, a number of KPIs de depending on the business, but that's as, as far as, as it gets, uh, as a bit of background, uh, I work in the US with a large venture capital fund called Besmer um, while I was a student at MIT, my MBA. Uh, but if, and, 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 and the key, let's say the key commonality that you hear when, when you speak about the venture community is that uh, this is a too complicated business. So I just wanted to point out that uh, baseball, which is in the end a human trying to hit a ball, is a very analytics driven sport. Uh, as we believe, can be uh, venture investing. Of course, there's, there's a coach and of course, uh, there's uh, human involvement, but uh, w w what we believe is that a combination of uh, technology put in the hands of experienced investors will not only bring better uh, outcomes for, uh, for investors, but also allow investors to help community in more significant ways than spending a lot of, a lot of time just trying to find for the right startups to invest. The problem is very easy. There's poor data or no, or no data. Uh, the, we, we do a work that I, I, I'll let you know in a minute with publicly available data, but of course, the best data is, pri is pr privately held, so that's also a space where we're trying to, to put uh, our hands in and help investors do that. Uh, actually, investors, some investors, and, and some of them, the, the, the ones that are doing the best job are very quiet working on these things like Google Ventures or Sequoia. But there, there are others that openly share that you know they're they're using some some sort of uh, automation or or intelligence in order to find uh, startups or even in some cases to make co-investments uh, based on a good proprietary deal flow or an already curated. But you can see some examples, and it is growing, and that, that's why we believe there's the right timing to create a uh, product for to allow all investors leverage these sort of technologies. Why? Because well. Uh, Typically, uh, w what you end up is spending, uh, and this is figures of reported by the funds themselves, uh, uh, you, you, you end up spending millions and years in developing a system that you then don't know how to maintain, or you need to hire even more people to build these systems than the ones you have before in order to make the investments and, and, and bring the commercial expertise and the contact to clients and, and, and all these things. So, and, and, and with, with a solution like the one we are building, you can have it almost immediately and, and at a, f a very small fraction of the cost, definitely. Um, and I think that's, uh, that's, that's all I w what I wanted to say. Uh, we've been working on this for quite some time. We've got some you know, uh, press coverage. Of course, this is a hot topic, but we're doing real work. Uh, we're, as of now, collecting data from, uh, which is uh, uh, the, 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 the data set that will be applied to, to the contenders today. It's a small subset of, of our large data set. It's a data set of about uh, 400K companies with information coming, coming from uh, startup databases, social networks, uh, then uh, some like random information like uh, patent information, uh, but also we collect them, all the metadata and the company web pages. 
And that's uh, just the beginning. We recently got admitted into the FinTech Sandbox program in Boston, where uh, we're already working uh, to explore um, uh, the, the impact on some of the data that uh, these partners, for example, to just to name a few, uh, these are partners from the FinTech Sandbox program, but to explore the, the effect of this data in predicting or in helping actually investors uh, make investment decisions. And, and well, of course, if you want, if you want to try it, if particularly you have a fund or a corporate venture fund, uh, please reach out and, and we'd be happy to schedule a demo. I also wanted to take the opportunity to, well, uh, you already know uh, Thomas, but uh, I think they're doing a very brave uh, movement here. Uh, that's, uh, that's probably the first time that uh, this truly happens in the world. Like, uh, you're going to see a competition in a few minutes, and whatever the result, uh, uh, AIC uh, will we'll, uh, explore investment in, in, in this company, which I think is, is very brave. So, uh, uh, congratulations and thank you for the move. You wanted to say? Yeah, I'll be, I'll be very brief, but um, just a word. So, uh, thank you, Arturo um, Prisaris and, and Louis Pabis for the opportunity to, to sponsor the AI Startup Battle. Um, so, as Arturo said, so we're putting up a hundred thousand pound um, investment to the winner of the battle, of which I do not know of the four companies it will be. Um, so, yeah, I think I'll, I'll finish by saying uh, good, good luck to the founders who are who are um, who are who are presenting. And uh, yeah, so do we? Do you know yeah. what's that? Can you can you guys go on stage? Just a, a very brief bit about AIC. So. Um, we, we're at sort of an early stage investor investing uh, specifically in uh, what we call AI-fast um, companies, uh, initially here in the UK, but ac across uh, Europe and, and, and beyond. Um, we, we typically invest um, from as little as a hundred thousand uh, pound investment, uh, and we've invested in companies that are uh, across a, a sort of broad range of industry, so from companies looking at applications in health, so using ECG data to predict things like sudden cardiac arrests, um, to companies working with uh, some of the large banks surrounding us, looking at um, robotic process automation in sort of trading desks. So yeah, we've, we've got a sort of a, a wide array, um, and, and you, can, you can see our portfolio. We've done uh, over 20 investments in the last year, which I think makes us one of the most active, uh, at, least, at least here in Europe. And I think I'll pass on to get on with the show. Great. Thank you, Thomas, again. Almost. Yeah. We're working on it. <laughs> uh, it's alphabetical. It's alphabetical. OK. So it's going to be alphabetical order. Uh, let me check. Yeah, I think Antiverse is going to be the first one. So if you, you can come up on stage, you have an interview. We got video and everything. Fantastic. Okay. You ready? Yep. All right. Here we go. Let's. Yep. Okay. Tell pre-series <coughs> to start the battle. 
Welcome to the startup battle. I have loaded the latest model and I am ready to score the startups. If you are ready to score Antiverse IO, say yes to hear the first question. Yes. Before we begin, tell me in five words or less about your company. We discover new medicines. What is the length of the company name and characters? Nine. How many years of VP engineering experience does the VP of engineering have in this or other companies? Five. How many employees does the company have? Three. How many times has the CEO been a CEO of any company? Two. How many co-founders does the company have in the current team? Three. How many years of working experience does the CEO have? <laughs> Ten. How many times has the CEO been a CEO of any company? <laughs> Two. <laughs> Is the company Twitter account verified by Twitter? <laughs> no. How many college degrees have been awarded among all employees? Four. How many years of working experience at any job does the CTO have? Seven. How many companies has the CTO founded before? One. How old is the CTO? Oh. <laughs> uh, 34. How many co-founders does the company have? Three. Does the company have a dedicated Twitter account? No. Sorry. How many patents were granted to the company by the end of the first year? <laughs> none. None. The first year patents should be a number. Expect... Zero. Okay, that is all I needed. I have computed your score for the battle. It doesn't show to the end. Oh. <laughs> you have to wait. Thank you. That was a long one. That was long. The longest you ready? The longest oh. we've ever had. Yeah. So far, so good. Okay, I don't have res received pronunciation, <laughs> um, so you ready? I'm Irish broke, so we'll see how it goes. Good. All right. Tell pre-series to score the next startup. No. What? what? The AI might not be ready. Tell. Oh, we got a timeout. Sorry, your echo lost its connection. Still need the internet. What time is it? Sorry, your echo lost its connection. We're experiencing technical difficulty. What time is it? The time is 9.04 a.m. My time. <laughs> Ask pre-series to score the next startup. If you are ready to score logical clocks, say yes to hear the first question. Yes. Are you ready to answer questions about logical clocks? I am expecting a yes or no response. A little long. Yes. If you are ready to score logical clocks, Quicker. say yes to hear the first question. Yes. Before we begin, tell me in five words or less about your company. Hyperscale AI for the enterprise. How many employees does the company have? Four. Is the company Twitter account verified by... No. How many co-founders does the company have in the current team? Seven. How many college degrees have been awarded among all employees? Thirty-six. Does the company have a dedicated Twitter account? Yes. The Twitter account should be a category. Example values true, 
False. You can also say stop to end input and make a prediction, or you can say cancel to reset the questions. Again. Answer again. Oh, sorry. Would you like to skip this prediction question? No. No. Does the company have a dedicated Twitter account? No. Okay, that is all I needed. I have computed your score for the battle. <laughs> okay. I hope they like college degrees. <laughs> Yeah, it's alphabetical. Huh? Okay. Ask pre series to score the next startup. If you are ready to score T Bly, say yes to hear the first question. Sorry. Yes. Before we begin, tell me in five words or less about your company. Robotic process automation in customer communication. How many years of working experience at any job does the CTO have? Three. How many employees does the company have? Zero. <laughs> Zero. How many co-founders does the company have in the current team? Three. How many patents were granted to the company by the end of the first year? Zero. The first year patents should be a number. Expected values are between zero and 45. You can also say stop to end input and make a predict. Zero. Is the company Twitter account verified by Twitter? No. What is the length of the company name in characters? Six. How old is the CTO? Twenty-eight. How many PhDs does the company have? One. How many years of VP engineering experience does the VP of engineering have in this or other companies? Three. Is the company name the same as or very similar to the Facebook account name of the company? No. How many companies has the CTO founded before? One. How many patents were granted to the company by the end of the third year? Zero. How many patents were granted to the company oh. by the end of the second year? <laughs> <laughs> ah. Zero. Is the CEO a co-founder of the company? True or false? True. How old is the VP of engineering? 28. 28. How many years of working experience does the CEO have? 14. How many college degrees have been awarded among all employees? Five. How many years of working experience at any job does the CTO have? Three. How many followers does the company Twitter account have? 38. How many jobs has the CTO had in total? Three. Does the company have a dedicated Twitter account? Yes. How many years of CEO experience does the CEO have in this or other companies? Four. How many MBAs does the company have? Zero. Good choice. How many companies has the CEO founded before? One. How many companies has the VP of engineering founded before? One. How many times has the CEO been a CEO of any company? Twice. The CEO jobs as CEO should be a number. Expected <laughs> values are be Two. How many office locations does the company have? 
Zero. The number of locations should be a number. Expected values. Zero. How many co-founders does the company have? Three. Okay, that is all uh, I needed. I have completed your sign. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you. I was getting worried for a minute. There. You ready? Ask Pre-Series to score the next startup. If you are ready to score TensorFlight, say yes to hear the first question. Yes. Before we begin, tell me in five words or less about your company. Autonomous Remote Property Inspection. How many employees does the company have? Fifteen. How old is the VP of Engineering? Twenty-nine. How many co-founders does the company have in the current team? Two. The number of co-founders' current teams should be a number. You can Expected right. values. Two. How many college degrees have been awarded among all employees? Twenty-nine. Is the company Twitter oh. account verified <laughs> by Twitter? No. You can go back. How many followers does the company Twitter account have? 309. Okay, that is all I needed. I have computed your score for the battle. No. <laughs> all right. That's it, now we all go home. Yeah. No. <laughs> okay. Ask pre-series to begin ranking. Sure, I have compiled all the scores. Ask me the results. Ask pre-series which startup is ranked fourth. The fourth startup is T. Bly with the score 67.94. There should be some applause. Yeah. <laughs> Ask pre-series which startup is ranked third. The third startup is Antiverse IO with the score 85.04. Ask Pre-Series which startup is ranked second. The second is TensorFlight with the score 97.03. Ask pre-series, who is the winner? Silly humans. There is only one competitor left, and the winner is Logical Clocks, with the pre-series score, 97.32. That's it. Get to come out with the, uh, the comedy oversized jack. So I, I can only, so I can only assume this is biased with Irish accents, obviously, <laughs> it work very well. Pending due diligence, we want to see your 32 okay. uh, <laughs> degrees and uh, so we got more than that, intensive flights, 189. <laughs> but yeah, congratulations and thank you to all the founders for participating. So it, uh, basically it's going through the model and asking questions and depending on the answer, it might need new information. And you can actually have it s skip questions and then it'll ask you everything. So it'll go much longer. Yep. So it tries to find the optimum path to the prediction. Yep. That's it? Is that it? Yeah, okay, thanks, thanks again. Talk about right. toys and go home. No, I think you have a demo also, no? Yep. Can, do, do you? <laughs> <laughs> All right, anyways, as big a man, you have a demo. No, you don't? Well, anyways. Uh, <laughs>
And that's it for today. Uh, thank you very much for coming. Uh, no, that's not it for today. There's drinks, uh, probably the most important part of the day for some of us. Uh, from four, five to seven, that's it. Is that four? Yeah. Um, so we go downstairs to level 38, back there again, uh, have a few drinks. I'd like to, before we go, I'd like to thank again all of our session chairs and program chairs and speakers for, you know, making a very nice uh, program for this first day of Pepe's Europe 2018. And we'll be back tomorrow at nine. Uh, until then, I uh, hope to see you downstairs and um, yeah, hope to see you again tomorrow. Thank you. <laughs>